välkommen till Vändepunkt Norad konferensen 2022. Vi får stort fint besök, ett styck utvecklingsminister, flera nationella experter och världens ledande stämmer. Ja, det här är er rätt och slett årets viktigaste konferens för dig som är er upptatt av klima, bärkraft och fattigdomsbekämpelse. Jag heter Asta Bosinge Lidersen och ska leda dig genom programmet. Konferensen är er helt digital och delt i tre med gode pauser emellan. Så om du följer oss live eller i efterkant så har du därför mye och glädje dig till. Det blir faglig input och engagerade samtaler. Vi ska utfordra gamla tankesätt och presentera nya idéer och lösningar och för att kickstarta det hela dagens svart Nora direktör Bordvega Solhjell. Tack för det Asta. Jag sitter här med en färsk positiv coronatest, men heldigvis väldigt god form på löpning. Jag är er lika glad för att säga si till alla samman välkommen på vägna av oss i Norad. Vi vi har lagt ett väldigt spännande program syns vi. Och vi har 1700 påmälte och många fler som följer oss på olika streamer. Titeln på konferensen är er Vändepunkt och Vändepunkt är er ett fint ord syns jag. Men det er kanske ända mer träffande på engelsk som en engelsk titel på konferensen Game Changing Solutions. Jag kan dy mig för engelska ord i norsk språk själv, men här innehåller ordet något mer. Ett vändepunkt som på något sätt ändrar spelreglerna, snur upp ner på utvecklingen, accelererar framgång. Och ett sånt vändepunkt, det fick vi i fjor. Jag vill påstå att det var det viktigaste framskrittet världen gjorde i 2021. För att ett år med forskning, många miljoner investeringar, så klarte världen äntligen och utveckla en vaccin mot malaria. Det har tagit 35 år. en norrman, Tore Godal, han var med på att starta det här och har jobbat för det sedan. I följe världens hälsoorganisation så vill malaria vaccinet kunna berge mellan 40.000 och 80.000 liv kvart enaste år. Den är er inte perfekt. Vi må rulla den ut, vi må få en ända bättre vaccin med större effekt, men den vill likväl bli en game changer ett vännekompott. Och slå den typen framskritt, den syns jag är er värt att fira. För dig kommer inte av sig själv. Det är er resultat av systematisk arbete, av akademisk forskning, ekonomiska investeringar och politisk vilja. Och den världen vi lever i, det tioåre vi är er i, de utmaningarna vi står i, de ropar efter den typen vännekompott. För det första för de pilarna har snudd efter en generation med social och ekonomisk framgång så blir det nog fler extremt fattiga i världen. De sista estimata tal dock vill få uppsummat efter på en rapport från Norad pekar på att så många som 100 miljoner människor kan ha blivit skjutna ut i extrem fattigdom under en pandemi. Därnäst för de klimakrisen och Parisavtalens 1,5 graders mål kräver att världen grovt sett halverar utsläppen sina på ett år till 2030 och når netto null runt 2050. Samtidigt som vi tar vare på naturen vår. Og den viktigaste ändringen vi ska göra det är er total energiomställning från fossil till förnybar. Och där är er klimatfinansiering genom biståndsbudgeten Norges centrala internationella virkemiddel. För att nå målen Det är er det tredje poängen här. Så måste vi bruka rätt verktyg. Vi måste göra det kunskapen fortäller oss har störst effekt för att avskaffa fattigdom, kutta utsläpp och reducera olikhet. Alltså och nå bärkraftsmålen. Och då måste vi la fakta ha makta. Bistand och utvecklingspolitik kan vara mäktiga vapen. Och norsk bistand har uppnått imponerande resultat samma andra. Norsk vaccinbistand har en avgörande faktor i att vaccinera över en halv miljard barn mellan 2005 och 2016. Från 2013 till 2016 bidrog Norge att 3,1 miljoner barn fick gå på skola genom det vi finansierade. Och i perioden den norska regnskogssatsningen arbetade med Brasil så blev det sparat utsläpp på 4 miljarder ton CO2. Och för att förstå vad det är er, Det tillsvarar omtrent 70 gånger så mycket som Norges årliga utsläpp. 
för exempel. Så bistand virker, men bara god bistand virker. Och sista del i dag ska handla om vad som ger resultat och vad som inte gör det. Hur vi lär fakta ha makta. Här och nu står vi längre ifrån och nå bärkraftsmålen än vi har gjort på länge. Men vi människor har i oss och är er i stånd till att lösa enorma utmaningar när vi samarbetar. Det är er bakteppet för dagens konferens. Lösningar, vändpunkt. Välkommen till en flott dag sammen med oss i Norden. Tusen tack Bård Vegar. Då är er ju ton satt och konferensen är er, eh, som sagt delt i tre. Det första tema vi ska ta för oss det är er tema fattigdom och olikhet och i löpe av detta tioåret så ska vi ju ifølge FN utrydde extrem fattigdom men hur ligger vi egentligen an sett i lys av pandemin? Det vet fagdirektör i utvecklingsekonomi Lars Lomi om. Han har bakgrund fra offentlig økonomi, makroøkonomi og inntektsfordeling, og har blant annet jobbet i Finansdepartementet og de siste 15 årene i Norad. Lars Lo står klar med statusrapporten, men først ta en titt på dette. Our aim is to meet those Millennium Development Goals and for us to dedicate ourselves to work together to eliminate in our time and in this generation the worst of deprivation and poverty. Yet so great is the distance that we still have to travel to achieve them that they could only be met by all of us each playing our part. Our aim is clear, our mission is possible, and our destination is in our sight. An end to extreme poverty by 2030. A life of peace and dignity for all. Ja, vad krävs nu för att nå målet? Fattigdomsmålet har en ambition om att utrydde alla former för fattigdom överallt. Det centrala delmålet är er likväl att utrydde extrem fattigdom, definierat som att leva för mindre än 1,90 amerikanska dollar om dagen. Bilden av utvecklingen sedan 1990 visar ett grundlag för optimisme, men också det som nå bekymrar. Framgången har varit stor men bremset upp allerede för pandemin som har skapat en bratt motbakke. Antal extremfattiga har fallt med 1,2 miljarder människor sedan 1990. Där i Asia fattigdomen har gått starkast ned. Kina alene med mellan 6 och 700 miljoner människor. I Afrika söder för Sahara har däremot extremfattigdomen ökt med 150 miljoner människor sedan 1990. Forskellen i den bakenforliggende ekonomiska utvecklingen är er tydlig. Här målt med växt i nationalprodukt per inbygger. Det fortäller mycket om utvecklingen i genomsnittlig inkomstnivå. Många asiatiska land byggde en växtmotor med höga investeringar, exportindustrier och bred näringsutveckling som gav hög och långvarig framgång. Fler och mer produktiva jobber stöttet upp av ökt utbildningsnivå och lavere befolkningsväxt. I Afrika sør for Sahara er befolkningsveksten fortsatt nærmere 3 procent. Også denne regionen hade som vi ser et godt første tiår i dette årtusende, men var nok for mye drevet av høye råvarepriser og for lite av fremtidsrettet næringsutvikling. Med like rask nedgang i fattigdom som Vietnam 
ville fattigdomsmålet kunne nås rundt 230 i Uganda og Tanzania. Malawi ville selv med, sin, selv med en slik framgang trenge en god del år til. Det er i vår tid vanskeligere å utnytte verdensmarkeder og teknologi på samme måte som da de asiatiske landene klarte dette. Internasjonal konkurranse er blitt tøffere, og produksjonsmetoder mer høyteknologiske og kompetansekrevende. En mer realistisk vei for Afrika sør for Sahara kan være å prioritere en industrivekst mer rettet mot nasjonale og regionale markeder, kombinert med styrking av produktiviteten i en sterk voksende tjenestesektor, og ikke minst landbruket. Fattigdomsutfordringen er mer enn de anslagsvis 700 millioner ekstremfattige. 24 prosent, eller 1,8 milliarder mennesker, lever for under 3,2 dollar om dagen, eller nesten like mange som var under ekstremfattigdomsgrensen i 1990. Mer enn 1 milliard mennesker lever over ekstremfattigdomsgrensen, men under 3,2 dollar om dagen. Globalt lever rundt 44 prosent, eller 3,5 milliarder mennesker, for under 5,5 dollar om dagen. Forskjellen på landgruppene er stor. I lavintektslandene sett under ett er nesten halvparten ekstremfattige. I gjennomsnitt er inntektsnivået i øvre mellominntektsland nesten ni ganger høyere enn det er i lavintektsland. I lavere mellominntektsland er det tre og en halv gang høyere. De fleste lavintektslandene er i Afrika sør for Sahara. I tillegg har noen av de lavere mellominntektslandene høy fattigdom. Det ferske mellominntektslandet Tanzania er et eksempel. Denne figuren bryter opp det globale bildet med tenkte tisentsgrenser over ekstremfattigdomsgrensen. For hver tiende cent fattigdomsgrensen heves, øker antall fattige i gjennomsnitt med nærmere 70 millioner mennesker. 10 cent per dag, eller en krone, en krone antyder også at lite skal til av tilbakeslag før antallet under ekstremfattigdomsgrensen på 1,9 dollar øker. Et annet bekymringsfullt trekk ved fattigdomsbildet er fattigdommens dybde, eller hvor langt under ekstremfattigdomsgrensen forbruket til de ekstremfattige er. Selv om den internasjonale grensen på 1,9 dollar er lav og betegnes ekstrem fattigdom, har flere land lavere nasjonale grenser og mange med forbruk betydelig under den internasjonale grensen. De er ultrafattige. Og dyp fattigdom er nok noe av forklaringen når effekten av økonomisk vekst på antall fattige har vært svak i mange land. Fattigdom handler ikke bare om forbruk og inntekt. Flerdimensjonal fattigdom måles som kritisk lav tilgang på helsetjenester, skole, elektrisitet, sanitærforhold eller rent vann. I utviklingslandet sett under ett anslås 1,3 milliarder mennesker å leve i flerdimensjonal fattigdom. Også for slik fattigdom har det vært nedgang. Den skal være forsiktig med å sammenligne her, men når flerdimensjonal fattigdom i mange land har falt raskere enn ekstrem fattigdom, kan det avspeile at tilgangen på helsetjenester og rent vann er bedre raskere enn avlinger eller lønninger. Pandemien skapte det største globale tilbakeslaget siden annen verdenskrig. I figuren er avviket fra de makroøkonomiske trendene, slik de så ut ved starten av 2020, sammenlignet med bildet i januar i år. Nullinja er utviklingen uten pandemi. Rike land ble rammet kraftig, men skaden sitter dypere i fattigere land. Figuren kan gi inntrykk at det bare er snakk om lengre tid. Men mange av utviklingslandene som henter inn tapet noen år etter rike land, vil ha flere mer langvarige skader enn det figuren egentlig fanger inn. Den viktige forskjellen er skaden på selve produksjonsapparatet, menneskenes produktivitet og ikke minst statsfinansene. Alt dette er mer sårbart, og skadene for vokst er større desto lenger la vaksinering opprettholder usikkerheten. I lavintektsland er bare 5,5 prosent fullvaksinerte i midten av januar. Rike land har dessuten ikke bare vaksinert i stor stil, men brukt formidable finansielle muskler på å begrense skaden på økonomienes virkemåte. 
Rike land har realøkonomisk og finansiell ryggrad til å tåle økt gjeld. I fattige land truer statlige gjeldskriser ikke bare statenes økonomi, men også tilgangen på private investeringer. Faren for selvforsterkende svekkelse er stor og pågår allerede. Heldigvis er dette mekanismer som kan snus til selvforsterkende oppgang. Det krever at økt internasjonal støtte og bedre nasjonal politikk understøtter hverandre gjensidig. Pandemien har ført til at husholdningsundersøkelser som danner grunnlaget for å måle fattigdom og levekår er stoppet opp. Det gjøres derfor anslag basert på antatt fall i forbruk og inntekt. Figuren viser Verdensbankens anslag der antallet ekstremfattige i 2020 og 2021 beregnes å være nesten 100 millioner flere enn uten pandemien. Tilbakeslaget var antatt størst i 2020 og hentet seg noe inn som følge av oppgang i 2021. Usikkerheten er stor om de to første pandemiårene, enda større videre fremover. De akutte utfordringene er vaksinering og finansiering. Gitt at disse håndteres godt nok, er spørsmålet hva slags utvikling som kan gjenreises ut av det. Å gå fra dagens utgangspunkt til asiatiske veksteventyr er urealistisk. Fattigdomsbildet og mer realistiske vekstscenarier fremover tilsier at jevnere fordeling må gjøre en større del av jobben enn tidligere for å få ned fattigdommen. Verdensbankens scenarier til 2030 illustrerer dette tydelig. Med samme gjennomsnittlig og jevnt fordelt inntektsvekst som det siste tiåret før pandemien vil oppunder 600 millioner fortsatt være ekstremfattige i 2030. I dette tallet er ikke Verdensbankens egne anslag på økt fattigdom som følger av klimaendringer med, ytterligere mer enn 100 millioner. Tilstrekkelig bidrag fra mindre ulikhet vil også bli krevende. Desto færre år det er til at 2030-målet skal nås, desto større, mer direkte, og raskt virkende innsats vil kreves. Ofte med en pris i form av mindre finansielt rom for å bygge langsiktig vekst. Flertallet av de fattige bor på landsbygda, der produktiviteten i landbruket er en sentral faktor. Men millioner av mennesker søker nå byene hvert år. Bedre jobber i den sterkt voksende tjenestesektoren og industri vil være avgjørende både for deres levekår og den langsiktige vekstevnen i økonomiene. Det er store finansieringsbehov på alle områder. Det gir dilemmaer i nasjonal politikk og i utviklingsfinansiering. Uten bedre kraftforsyning og annen infrastruktur bremses næringsutvikling som kan gi varig høy vekst opp. Uten større og mer direkte innsats mot fattige, enten det er tiltak i landbruket eller annen målrettet innsats, kan store grupper fattige forbli frikoblet fra utvikling. Selv om en lykkes å få ny fart i finansiering av investeringer og annen innsats som fremmer næringsgrunnlaget, kreves trolig økte bidrag fra direkte overføringer for å virke rask nok og brett nok i et gjenstridig fattigdomsbilde. Utbygging av slike ordninger har skutt fart, men betyr fortsatt lite i totalbildet. Potensialet for omfordeling er begrenset i de fattigste landene. Land noe oppover på inntektsskalaen kan ha skattegrunnlag å ta, ikke minst land med ressursrikdom. Men de mangler progressive skattesystemer som gjør jobben. Det er ikke bare en administrativ, men først og fremst en politisk utfordring. På kort sikt vil direkte innsats mot fattige handle mer om omprioritering innenfor trange statsbudsjetter og bistand enn omfordeling fra de rike i deres egne land. Utgangspunktet er at verden nå er ute av kurs for å nå fattigdomsmålet. Hvor sterke dilemmaene blir, og hvor stor framgang som kan oppnås, vil fremover avhenge av politikken landene velger å føre, og hvor mye finansiell og annen støtte fra verdensstamfunnet de får. Ja, det var et stort, komplekst og alvorlig bilde som Lars Lo tegnet opp der. Tusen takk, Lars. 
vite vad ska man göra. Det som vi vet säkert är er att vi må göra noe. Och så finns det någon som sitter centralt placerat i det arbete och en av dem är er utvecklingsminister Anne Beate Tvinnereim. Välkommen till Norad konferensen. Tusen tack för det. Um, nu hörte vi ju att uh, extremfattigdomen var allerede ökande för pandemin. Men uh, under pandemin så har det alltså blivit 100 miljoner fler extremfattiga i världen. Vad är er de viktigaste greppen för att snu den utvecklingen? Ja, det är er ju flera. För det första som jag ser si att uh, titeln på detta seminare, vändpunkten, det är er ju vel, det är er väldigt gott. Och Detta budskap borde egentligen varit sent på CNN och Al Jazeera och BBC överallt för vi har åtta år på oss för 2030 för de och nu ser vi att exploderar och går i fel riktning efter faktiskt eh, någon tio år med en positiv utveckling i bekämpelse av fattigdom. Um, det vi må ta in över oss är er först och främst att det håller inte och baka kaka större. Vi må också se på fördelningen av det och vi måste se på hur vi bakar den kaka. För vi kan inte fortsätta eh, och eh, vi kan vi kan inte fortsätta att producera ett överskott på den måten vi har gjort för för att vi må eh, bekämpa klimakrisen och eh, och tappa naturmangfold samtidigt. Och så må vi få på plats eh, apparater för omfördelning. Eh, og da må jo vi, for eksempel, som eh, Norge som aktør, jobbe normativt med de internationella systemene i forhold til skatt, bekjempelse av eh, korruption og så videre, eh, samtidig som vi sørger for att få på plass eh, et, eh, en, en eh, eh, vekst nedenfra. Altså, jeg er veldig opptatt av at denne veksten må skapes i lokalsamfunn. Vi må starte der. Eh, Men nå, nå var du inne på detta med omfördelning och det var ju också ett centralt poäng Lars Lo kom med på slutet av sin inledning. Um, omfördelning och då då nämner han ju att man inte på något bara kan tänka på eh, växt och omfördelning internt i för exempel lavinkomstland men att man måste se på en kanske en hårdare prioritering och omfördelning inför biståndsbudgeten. Vad tänker du om det? Jag tror vi må jobba längs längs flera linjer alltså biståndsforte är er ju att vi kan eh, sikte den in mot de aller fattigste och aller mest marginaliserade. Och så må vi ha med oss privata eh, på laget eh, för att dra den utvecklingen i riktig riktning. Um, og, og, og så må jag också tillbaka till detta med alltså fattigdomskrisen ska bekämpas samtidigt som vi ska bekämpa en klimakris. Men detta kan göras i detta kan ses i sammanhang och det är er ju på något det mandatet jag har fått med mig som biståndsminister i Hurdalsplattformen vår så står det att vi ska förena kampen för utveckling med kampen mot klimatändringar. Uh, og uh, många av de alla fattigaste i världen är er ju också de som är er mest utsatt för uh, klimatändringar så klimatillpassning uh, kommer till att stå väldigt centralt i uh, i insatsen uh, vår. Det handlar ju bland annat om ehm uh, uh, och matproducenten där ute som Lars Lo var inne på är er en särskilt utsatt grupp men hvor vi också vet att hvis vi klarer att få produktiviteten i landbruket mm. så er det, har det en väldigt stor avkastningseffekt. Ja. Nei, vi ska snacka lite mer om akkurat det med landbruk efterpå men um, jag tänker fortsatt på det sporet i forhold til det med omfördelning för det som är er komplicerat med bærekraftsmålene uh, er är ju att världen är er ju så komplex Och bärkraftsmålen synliggör ju nettop det ved att alla dessa tingene hänger samman med allt. Så man ska både jobba med fattigdomsbekämpelse och man ska jobba med klima. Um, kan du se si lite mer om hur den regeringen kommer till att göra det? Och bekämpa detta samtidigt? Ja, nettop. Um, igen, den utvecklingen må skapas nedenfra. Och jag är er upptatt av att eh, bygga för exempel då lokala värdekedjor eh, som, eh, som som som, som skapar en eh, ripple effekt. Det vi är er ute efter är er ju samhällsändring, inte sant? Eh, och det måste skapas eh, genom eh, 
många olika olika virkemidler. men vi vet ju att och nu är er jag tillbaka till detta du spurte hur kan man se det i sammanhang. bland annat genom att investera i en nämnt landbruk men också förnybar energi. Det och ge tillgång till förnybar energi ger inte bara eh möjlighet för eh, lokala värdekedjor men det skapar också en massa andra eh, ringvirkningar eh, och bärkraftiga jobber. Mm. Um, du hade lust att snacka lite om detta med landbruk mm. och uh, varför spelar för exempel landbruk och småbönder en viktig roll i detta? Vi vet att väldigt många av de allra fattigaste är er de som uh, selv är er matproducenter. Många av de som sulter är er selv matproducenter och det är er ett et stort paradox. Och så är er jag upptatt att alltså landbruk är er, alltså primärnäringen landbruk fiske är er ju är er ju på något sätt där vi kommer fra. Det var där vårt eget land kom fra, och vi skulle genom ett hamskifte. Ikke sant? Norge gick igenom det vi kallar det stora hamskifte för att för som, som en del av vår utveckling. Detta är er ju processer som väldigt många utvecklingsland nå står mitt uppe i och det och lägga till rette för att uh, man i landbruket da kan skapa ett överskudd uh, samtidigt som man lägger om till bärkraftig landbruk och uh, sørge för att folk kan mat i magen. Det menar jag er väldigt väldigt god utveckling. Mm. Um på vilken måte tänker du då att norska erfarenheter kan vara nyttig och ha med in i hur man tänker då om om utvecklingspolitik? Du nämnde det stora hamskiftet. Är er det sammanlängbart med de eh, utfordringarna som finns i lavinkomstland i söder idag? Vi har många erfarenheter från Norge som jag mener är er relevant att ta med in i bistånd. Uh, Nu snakker vi akkurat om landbruk. Måten vi har organisert oss på genom for eksempel samvirker i norsk primærnæring, det er en erfaring som jeg vet er etterspurt i mange utviklingsland. Men det er mange andre ting som vi har som vi har å være stolte av i Norge som jeg mener vi skal ta med videre. En mm. ting jeg er veldig opptatt av er universaliteten i de sosiale sikkerhetsnettene. At vi i bistanden sørger for at man har att att at, at det lägger till rette för universella ordningar som är er tillgängliga för för alla. Undgå att man lager ikvant A och B lösningar, private private tillbydare och så vidare som som gör att som i nästa omgång vill skapa ulikhet i de länder vi snackar om. det har ju varit en succéfaktor för Norge som jag mener vi må huske på när vi nå bidrar bidrar i utvecklingen. Men att skapa såna typer av universella lösningar det kräver en viss ekonomi i bånd. Det är er det många land som inte har. Det är er klart, men vi vet ju också kostnaden ved att designa institutioner och samfund som skapar olikhet på sikt. Det att reducera olikhet, det är er också väldigt god ekonomi och det är er nödvändigt för att skapa god samfund. Mm. Um, nu startar vi denna samtal med att snacka om pandemiens uh, ringvirkningar och ett av de poängen som Lars Lo trekker fram och som har varit diskuterat väldigt väldigt mycket det handlar ju om tillgång till vacciner. Uh, jag har bakgrund från Uganda och familjen där och de får ju vacciner genom uh, Covax men det är er många som inte vill ta dem. Mm. Og det tänker jag eh, synliggör också en del av det hvor komplext allt detta är er. att det kan vara mangel på kunskap, eh, mangel på utdannelse och andra typer faktorer som att man kanske ikke stoler på myndigheterna mm. som gör att man då ikke benytter sig av de tillbuden. Kan du kommentera det på någon måte och hvordan Norge vill eh, bidra till eh, en bedre vaccinedekning för exempel? Ja, det var ett stort stort spörsmål. Ja. Du var inne på detta med tillit og det är er ju också helt helt grundläggande. Vi må designa systemer hvor, hvor vi bygger tillit mellan myndigheter och befolkning. Det är er ikke minst viktig i i hälsosektorn. När det gäller pandemihantering så tror jag att vi går in i ett år nå hvor svaret blir ännu mer komplext än det vi liksom stort sett har diskuterat 
det foregående året. Vi har haft veldig fokus på å få opp vaksineproduksjonen. Det er viktig. Vi har vært veldig fokus på den dypt urettferdige og ujevne fordelingen av vaksiner i verden. Det er tror jeg vi kommer til å se en rask løsning på nå, blant annet gjennom de systemene vi har bygd opp. Men vi kommer til å... Det kommer til å kreve veldig mye skreddersøm i hvert enkelt land for faktisk å få satt disse vaksinene. Og nå ser vi jo hvordan svake helsesystemer, altså fra bånd, begrenser hvordan vi skal få rullet ut vaksinene. Og det er har vi egentlig visst i mange måneder at vi kommer til å komme til et stadie hvor det er der begrensningene ligger. Og jeg er skuffet over at ikke vi har kommet lenger i på en måte den generelle styrkingen av helsesystemen i sør. Fordi det er der begrensningen kommer til å ligge nå. Og så synliggjør, altså det høres kanskje rart ut, men... Covid, altså pandemien, har jo vist, det har synliggjort de svakhetene ved det globale helsesystemet og de nasjonale helse, altså delivery-systemene i helsesektoren. Kanskje det er da en vekker, sånn at vi kan få gjort noe med de grunnleggende tjenestene, fordi at Altså, pandemihåndtering, det er et globalt fellesgode. Dette er, dette gjør vi for verden, men vi gjør det også for oss selv, ikke sant? Det er helt nødvendig å få dette på plass. Da må vi også investere i grunnleggende helsesystemer i utviklingsland. Så det har i hvert fall vært en øyeåpner for verden, håper jeg. Denne samtalen går mot slutten. Er det noe du har lyst til å dele helt til slutt? Har du en positiv nyhet eller en ny satsning, så har du sjansen da. Du, jeg tror du har fått med deg at jeg er veldig opptatt av matsikkerhet. Jeg mener at mat i magen, det er nødvendig for at unger skal lære, for at medisiner skal fungere i kroppene våre, og så videre og så videre. Jeg kommer til å bruke mye tid nå, det neste halve året, på å designe en stor ny innsats for bistand til matsikkerhet. Gleder meg til en tett dialog med norsk sivilsamfunn og andre aktører som vil bidra inn i denne nye satsingen på matsikkerhet. Det tror jeg blir veldig spennende. Tusen takk, statsråd Anne Beate Tvinnreim. Yes, vi går nå inn for en ny del. Vi er tilbake om et øyeblikk, og da på engelsk og i selskap av en verdenskjent fransk økonom. Ladies and gentlemen, we're very excited to present our first international guest. From his academic home at the Paris School of Economics, he takes a historical and statistical approach to show why some stay rich while others can't seem to break the cycle of poverty. He's professor of economics at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences and author of the best-selling book Capital in the 21st Century from 2013. His latest book, Capital and Ideology, was published in 2019 and has a global scope, focusing on how wealth is accumulated and inequality disseminated in different societies around the world. He's not here to talk about personal wealth and inheritance, as some would expect. His talk today is on development aid, carbon emissions and rising inequality. Professor Thomas Piketty, we are all ears. Hello, and, and thank you. Thanks a lot for your invitation. Uh, so, sorry, you know, I would love to be in, uh, with you uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm afraid I am in my office in, in Paris. So let me actually try to uh, share uh, my screen. Uh, I, and I hope this is um, 
you can see you can see this now. So you know, in in this talk, I actually I am going to talk also about inequality because I think this is very important uh, when we talk about carbon emissions and when we talk uh, talk about development aid. So what I'm going to do in this pre short presentation is basically two things. You know, first I'm going to show you some new evidence on income, wealth, but also gender and carbon inequality coming from the new uh, world inequality database and the brand new world inequality report 2022 which was just published a few weeks ago and you know this comes from a very collective uh, uh, project involving over 100 researchers from all over the world and and this is you know something in which we, we have put a lot of energy developing this uh, capacity uh, and, and and which is a sort of a way to observe the world through the lenses of, of inequality and then I will talk uh, about the consequences for development aid to, to summarize, you know, the big message of this presentation, you know, I think the magnitude of global inequality and in particular of negative climate externalities, uh, 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 you know, imposed by the richest uh, 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 economic actors uh, on this planet, you know, implies that in a way we need to go beyond standard development aid and and confront inequality in an in a, in a even more ambitious uh, manner. And so, I, you know, I just throw uh, on the table, you know, one, one simple proposal. But, you know, what about sharing at least a fraction of global tax revenues uh, paid by the world's most powerful economic actors, typically multinationals, billionaires, between all countries uh, according to uh, population? You know, we've been talking a lot about uh, international tax reform in 2021, but by and large, uh, countries in the South were, uh, you know, completely uh, uh, forgotten from this discussion. So let me start with point one about the new evidence about rising inequality. So, you know, I'm going to show you some data from the World Inequality Database. You can go online to the World Inequality Database website to, to get uh, more, uh, more details. Uh, let, let me start with this simple uh, map of the world uh, showing you, you know, the share of total income uh, going to the top uh, 10% uh, uh, of the citizen of each country. So if we had complete equality, the top 10% should get 10% of total income. If we had complete inequality, they should get 100%. So in practice, of course, the world is in between the two, in between 10 and 100%. But what I want to argue here, what I want to show you is that there's a lot of variation. So, you know, basically it goes from 20, 25, 30% in Europe to as much as 65 or almost 70% uh, in a country like South Africa. So, you know, it doesn't go from 10 to 100, but it goes from 20 to 70. So it's enormous variation. So inequality matters. And it's even more spectacular when you look at the uh, bottom 50% share, which in a way, you know, is even more important. And here you can see that it goes from, uh, so, you know, if we had complete equality, the bottom 50 percent should get 50 percent of total income. Uh, if we had complete inequality, they should get zero. So in practice, of course, it's always between the two again, but it goes from as little as 5% in a country like uh, uh, South Africa to 25%, uh, you know, in some European uh, countries. So it, it varies from a factor of 1 to 5, you know, from 5 to 25%, which implies that, you know, for a given average income for a given per capita GDP in a given country, the average income of the bottom 50% can vary from a factor of one to five. So again, you know, the big lesson is that uh, the distribution of income matters a lot. And if you only care about aggregate GDP and economic growth, etc., you know, you forget about the environment, of course, but you also forget about what really matters for the, you know, the bottom 50% of the, of the population. Now, this is a data on income inequality that we have developed over the year in the World Inequality Database. Recently, we've been publishing this World Inequality Report, extending our uh, uh, work uh, looking at wealth, uh, gender inequality, and and maybe even more importantly, carbon emissions, which I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna get at to conclude this uh, presentation. So first of all, regarding the concentration of wealth or 
you know, capital ownership, including, uh, you know, real estate, uh, business wealth, uh, financial assets, you know, everything that uh, household can own uh, around the world. Here, the big message is that, you know, the concentration of capital ownership is always a lot more extreme uh, than, than uh, income inequality. This is particularly extreme in developing countries. So if you look in sub-Saharan uh, Africa or, you know, in Latin America, which is a very unequal region, uh, the bottom 50% owns only 1% of total wealth. So, you know, this is extremely small. Now, in Europe, you know, which is, again, the most equal country, the most equal region of the world, uh, 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 you know, the, the bottom 50% owns uh, 4% of total wealth. So, you know, this is better than 1%, of course, but, you know, it is still very small. And even in a country like Norway or, you know, France, it will be typically less than 5%. So, here, you know, this means that the inequality in economic opportunities and the possibility to participate to the economy, because the, the ownership of wealth is also, you know, the opportunity to create a business, to to own your home, uh, to uh, put your family in a home. Uh, you know, this is really your capacity to act on your own life. You know, this, this is extremely unequally distributed, particularly in, in developing countries. Another novelty about, uh, you know, our inequality perspective in the World Inequality Report uh, 2022 is this new perspective on, on gender inequality. You know, sometimes we look at gender inequality uh, uh, for a given job, for a given occupation, and we say, oh, okay, women earn 10% or 20% less than men for this given job and occupation. But, of course, in practice, one of the main problems is that women don't have access to the same job and occupation. And if you take the share of women in total labor income, in fact, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty small, you know, pretty much everywhere. You can see on these graphs that all regions in the world, you know, are pretty far from gender parity. And, and uh, even, you know, in, in Europe, in Western Europe, you know, it is at the, comparable to the level of, of China, which, interestingly enough, it has been actually going down in, in recent uh, decades. That's partly because the increase of the share going to the top of the distribution, uh, uh, because most people at the top are actually men, uh, uh, has this kind of, uh, of paradoxical effect on the, on the time trend. Anyway, the, you know, the big message here again is that the indicators that we use to measure uh, what we do are very important because you know this can you know give us a different perspective. Let me conclude with with what I view as sort of probably the most important indicator uh, if we want to talk about uh, development aid uh, inequality at the global level, which is the very high uh, level of uh, uh, concentration of carbon emissions. So. That's one of the big novelties in this World Inequality Report 2022. We are able for all regions of the world, all countries in the world, to decompose you know, the level of carbon emissions uh, for the different groups in the distribution. And we, you know, we already knew that, of course, carbon emissions at the global level are very unequally distributed. So typically, you know, countries in the north you know, emit a lot of carbon and countries in the south are going to suffer from this carbon emission. What we show here is that within each country and within each region of the world, we also have enormous inequality. So, you know, here you see in, in, in Europe, if you look at the bottom 50% of the population, uh, the average carbon emission is about five uh, tons of carbon, which is, I mean, still too much. This has to be reduced, but, you know, this is sort of more or less in line with the ob European objective for uh, 2030 or 2040. Now, the problem is that the top 10% emit uh, 29 tons of carbon. And if you were to look at the top 1%, uh, even in Europe, it would be over 70 tons of, of carbon, which is the level that you see in North America already for the, for the top 10%. And, and, you know, this is the same in all regions of the world. You know, look at South and Southeast Asia, for instance. So what's the, the bottom line? You know, the bottom line is that if we design solution to fight a, a global warming and you know also to organize development aid where we treat everybody in the same manner and for instance we have proportional carbon tax in order to reduce everybody by the same proportion you know we we, we are missing a big part of the reality and also maybe we're going to have a big 
a, a problem, you know, convincing people in the bottom 50 percent that they need to make the same proportional effort than people in the top 10 percent. So, General conclusion, we have to take inequality uh, very seriously uh, if we want to, uh, you know, uh, fight, uh, you know, the, the biggest uh, challenges we have to uh, confront in the world today, which in my view are rising inequality and, and, and global warming. We need probably to, you know, to think beyond standard development aid. Uh, you know, when we talk about international tax reform, the taxation of multinationals, you know, we should take the right of all countries to development and the right of all countries to access, uh, uh, you know, tax base, a tax resource on a sustainable basis. We should take these rights seriously. Otherwise, uh, you know, we are going to to face a, a bigger and bigger uh, uh, problem, and in, you know, in some cases, uh, violence uh, and and major difficulties to to you know to to meet uh, our uh, global sustainable development goal objective. Thanks a lot for your attention. And thank you so much, Professor. That was really food for thought and it provided a great backdrop for the upcoming panel. Ja, for nå bygger vi videre på Piketty sitt innlegg med en samtale om ulikhet og utvikling. Her i studio har vi samlet et panel med engasjerte fagfolk. Gry Ballestad, avdelingsleder for utvikling og humanitært arbeid i Norsk Folkehjelp. Før det jobbet hun i FN-systemet. Hun har ledet humanitær seksjon i Redd Barna og Midtøsten seksjonen i Flyktninghjelpa. Så har vi Line Hegna, daglig leder i SIH, studentenes og akademikernes internasjonale hjelpefond. Hun har tidligere ledet Redd Barnas arbeid med politikk, kommunikasjon og kampanje og jobbet for FNs utviklingsprogram UNDP. Og så har vi Kristin Klemmet, daglig leder i Tenketanken Civita med en lang politisk karriere bak seg. Utdannings- og forskningsminister, arbeids- og administrasjonsminister samt stortingsrepresentant for Høyre. Hun har også vært visadministrerende direktør i NHO og kapteinen for det hele, for dette panelet. Det er seniorrådgiver i Norad, Nikolai Hegertun. Han har forsket og skrevet om utviklingsspørsmål og norsk bistand i en årrekke. Velkommen til dere alle. Takk for det, Asta. Ja, ulikhet og sosiale forskjeller er et ganske hyppig diskutert tema i både fagkretser, men også i politiske miljøer. Og med bevegelser som Occupy Wall Street og også et hvert ganske tunge faglige bidrag som vi har fått i mån i senere år fra siste taler, Pick Team, så har et hvert problemstilling knyttet til ulikhet tatt mer og mer plass på dagsordenen både i Norge og andre land. Samtidig ser vi nå at ulikhetsbegrepet rommer stadig flere ting og flere debatter knyttet til for eksempel vaksiner, til utdanning, rettigheter og så videre. I tillegg til selvsagt inntektsfordeling, kapital og formue. Og det er også et stort spenn i debatten om ulikhet mellom land og innad i land. Og i tillegg er det ofte sånn at debatten om ulikhet lett blander fag og politikk og ideologi. For det er litt ulike meninger om hva som driver ulikhet, hvor mye ulikhet som skal aksepteres, hva ulikhet gjør, og hvilke virkemidler vi har for å sette inn mot ulikhet. Så det jeg har lyst til å begynne med å svøre panelet om er... Hva er egentlig ulikhet, sånn som dere ser det? Og da har jeg lyst til å starte med deg, Gry, og så tar vi Lina, og så Kristin etter deg. Ja, først takk for invitasjonen, og jeg er veldig glad for at dere løfter denne tematikken. For det vi mener vi i Norsk Folkehjelp er noe av det viktigste man snakker om nå, når vi snakker om utvikling. Debatter om ulikhet blir ofte litt teoretiske, det handler om tall og mål og... Men for våre partnere rundt omkring i verden, så er ulikhet noe de føler på kroppen hver eneste dag. I mange land vi jobber i er det ekstremt store forskjeller. Land som Kolumbia, Libanon, Sør-Afrika, så bor ekstremt fattige og ekstremt rike side ved side, ofte bare adskilt av piggetråd og alarmsystemer. Og det skaper ofte misnøye og uro, og det gjør det veldig vanskelig å utvikle trygge samfunn og stabile samfunn. Vi i Redd Barna har som hovedmål for alt vårt utviklingsarbeid å redusere ulikhet og skape en mer rettferdig fordeling 
av makt och resurser. Och vår ingångsport till det är er, eh, civil jobbe med civilsamhällen runt omkring i världen, eh, jobbe med folkliga rörelser, för de utfordrar eh, urett, de eh, utfordrar myndigheterna sina på ulikhet och de kräver politiska tiltak. Men vi ser jo att det är er en väldigt farlig jobb och den har er blivit enda farligare under, pande- under pandemin och den kombination av ökande eh, ulikhet och mindre demokrati är er ekstre- eh, extremt skummel och eh, före till uro och protester runt omkring i världen. Och så ser vi att de eh, civilsamhällspartnerna vi jobbar med, de, de snakker inte bara om ekonomisk ulikhet, de upplever politisk ulikhet, de upplever social ulikhet. Och för oss så ger inte ulikhets altså det gick så mycket mening bara snacka om ekonomisk ulikhet för det hvis du inte snackar om makt så går du ikke på något sätt till kärnan av problemet. Eh, våra partnere är er väldigt upptagna av att eh, har du ekonomisk makt så har du ofta politisk makt också. Exempelvis alltså jag snackar om ett grelt exempel som Guatemala, hvor de ekonomiska eh, eliten har haft en enorm inflytelse också på de politiska ramarna har klart att eh, förhindra utvecklingen av skattesystemer och du står igen med ett land med, med en väldigt svag stat väldigt mycket social uro och sult i ett mellaninkomstland. Ja. Tack för det. Vi ska komma mer in på detta ett vart också men eh, från SIH sitt ståsted hur ser du på olika Vi ska kan bygga lite vidare på inledningen din och grys poänger så um, om vi ska ha ambitioner om att göra något med ekonomisk ulikhet så må vi i hvert fall ta in över oss att ulikhet bara ikke bara är er ekonomisk ulikhet är er, uh, ulikhet i makt i stämme i tillgång i representation uh, og den ulikheten eksisterer innad i land, den eksisterer mellom land, og den eksisterer også mellom oss som partnere i bistanden og det internationella arbeidet. Um, uh, og konsekvensene av den uh, ulikheten uh, er jo at den er, jo hverken, den er hverken blind eller tilfeldig. Den handler om uh, maktubalanse og noen som har interesse av og historie med och utöva makt och grupper som har historiskt sett också varit om inte maktlösa så satt i position hvor de inte har hvor de ikke har möjlighet till att bidra till och ta beslutningar och få bestämma hvordan pengar ett land brukes, hvordan intäkterna skapas och så vidare. Och när vi ska hela utgångspunkten för denna konferensen är er jo hvordan ska vi nå klara och göra detta skifte denne, dette detta vändpunkten som må till för att vi ska komma på rätt kör igen och som vi är er så immer långt ut och köra i forhold til att bära kraftsmålene. Och då må i fall utgångspunkt att det kan ikke være den samma gängen som sitter och gör det. Då får vi de samma gamla lösningarna, det samma eh, gamla tankegodse. Eh, så eh, vi må rätt och slett ge tillgång, adgång, makt och myndighet till nya grupper människor som bland annat våra partner eh, som är er urfolksgrupper som eh, utvecklar univers- bygger universiteter, eh, utvecklar kunskap, forskar där var de för i många hundra år har blivit forskat på nå utvecklar och forskar fram ett kunskapsgrundlag som kan vara ett alternativt kunskapsgrundlag där kanske för att ta beslutningar på än det vi har bak oss. så även om det är er lätt att önska att vi kunde gå för den där enkla klara definitionen av vad olikhet är er, så må vi nog förhålla oss till att det är er ganska sammansett och klara och jobba på alla de olika fronterna hvor vi upplever olikhet. Mm. Tack för det. Kristin Klemmet, du kan få lov til å kommentere også ut fra ditt ståsted hvordan du ser på dette. Når du stiller spørsmål så åpent da, og spør hva er ulikhet, så har jeg lyst til å være litt positiv også, fordi det er en form for ulikhet, et annet ord for ulikhet som vi bruker hver dag, og jeg er stolt over det, er jo mangfold. Så vi verdsetter jo ulikhet. Men når det blir så centralt i den politiske debatten her, her, så er det ulikhet i makt og resurser vi tänker på. Økonomisk ulikhet. Og igen for att kaste inn litt positivt, så har det jo nå inte pandemien vært en 30-års tid hvor vi har sett att den økonomiske ulikheten innad i mange land har økt litt, og noen steder mye. 
mens den økonomiske ulikheten mellom land og regioner og mellom alle verdens mennesker faktisk har gått ned. Og det skyldes jo at mange fattige land har vokst mer enn rike land, og at mange fattige mennesker har blitt mindre fattige. Og det har jo vært veldig positivt inntil pandemien. Og så vil jeg jo si at når vi snakker om økonomisk ulikhet også, så er ikke alt negativt ved det heller. Altså utsikter til økonomisk gevinst, det får mennesker til å anstrenge seg mer, til å ta risiko, satse sparepengene sine, kanskje gå lenger på skolen eller fullføre skolen, og så videre. Så det er veldig mye positivt ved det også. Men så har det også noen negative sider. Og ofte når man skal diskutere hva er det som gjør ulikhet negativt, og hva gjør det positivt, så ser man ofte på årsakene til at ulikheten oppstår. Og det er klart at i mange land, mange fattige land, så er det dårlige styringssystemer. Det er mangel på demokrati, det kan være nepotisme, korrupsjon, privilegier og så videre. Og det oppstår ulikhet av sånne grunner, og da er det jo negativt. Hvis det oppstår av mer av grunner som folk flest opplever som rettferdige, så er det jo ikke nødvendigvis negativt. For å sette det litt på spissen, hvis jeg tjener mindre enn deg på grunn av min hudfarge, så er det veldig negativt. Det er noe jeg ikke kan gjøre noe med. Hvis jeg tjener mindre enn deg fordi jeg heller vil late meg på soffaen enn å jobbe enn deg jeg kan jobbe, så oppleves ikke det som så urettferdig. Så jeg vil si at det bildet må nyanseres, men i denne sammenhengen så er det klart at man snakker om makt og ressurser, det er veldig mange ting, men jeg tror samtidig at hvis man skal gjøre godt i utviklingspolitikken og bistandspolitikken, så tror jeg det også er en fare knyttet til å prøve å konsentrere seg om alt på en gang. Og jeg tror personlig at det er viktigere å ha et blikk på fattigdomsreduksjon enn ulikhet i bistandspolitikken. Vi kan spørre dere om det også. Selv om ingen liker sosiale forskjeller og får stor ulikhet, så er det noen ganger vanskelig å unngå. Som Kristin Klemmen sier her, så er jo ulikhet som stammer fra korrupsjon og nepotisme og så videre. Diskriminering, det er jo ingen god ulikhet, men samtidig så har man jo eksempler på at industrialisering og sterk økonomisk vekst i fattige land leder til økt ulikhet. I hvert fall midlertidig. Og vi har jo også enkelte tiltak innenfor bistandspolitikken, for eksempel, som har mye større effekt på fattigdomsreduksjon enn på ulikhet. Så spørsmålet er, skal man i noen tilfeller da må man tillate litt økt ulikhet i perioder, eller skal det være et generelt mål om å alltid redusere denne? Jeg kan begynne med deg, Linne. Jeg tenker jo det er trist da, hvis vi tenker at industrialiseringen vi ser fremover skal innebære at vi aksepterer ulikhet eller økt ulikhet, og den må jo se annerledes ut enn industrialiseringen på 1700-tallet, eller for noen tiår siden. Og vi har jo også mye forskning som viser at ulikhet også virker negativt inn på økonomisk vekst. Og så har du jo, jeg representerer jo en menneskerettighetsorganisasjon, og ulikhet innebærer jo også ofte brudd på grunnleggende menneskerettigheter. Det er konsekvensen av ulikhet. Så jeg vil jo definitivt argumentere for at nei, vi skal ikke akseptere ulikhet som en del av den økonomiske veksten. Vi må jo ha mål om å jobbe frem en industrialisering, en økonomisk vekst som i mye større grad enn vi har lykkes med tidligere, klarer å gjøre det uten at vi ser disse store forskjellene. Vil du kommentere på det, Ingrid? Ja, jeg tenker jo at det har vel blitt tilbakevist ganske mange ganger at det er en automatikk at økonomisk vekst må medføre økt ulikhet. Blant annet Piketty, som vi akkurat hørte, har har jobbet med det. Og vi ser jo at politiske tiltak virker. Det ser vi over hele verden. Fagorganisering har en effekt. Demokratisk mobilisering har en effekt. Det påvirker politikken. Det påvirker lønnssettelse. Så å gå inn i en sånn diskusjon om at det må, at ulikhet må til, tenker jeg er helt feil. Altså, tvert imot så tror jeg at vi kan kunne få til å nå bærekraftsmålene mye raskere og redusere fattigdom mye raskere hvis vi har et fokus på å fordele makt og ressurser.
Ja. Eh, kort kommentar för Kristina för att ta nästa. Alltså jag känner inte till något demokratiskt samfund som har absolut likhet. Eh, så det är er olikhet, men det är er väldigt forskel på nivå på olikhet. Många fattiga land, eh, udemokratiska land, så är er det groteska forskeller och de stammer från orsaker som vi vill betrakta som väldigt orättfärdiga. Det är er nu helt annat så att hvis man tänker sig att det uppstår en viss olikhet eh, i ett fattigt samfund fördi man får till näringsutveckling och någon lyckas bättre än andra. Eh, med det så är er det en helt annan form för olikhet än den som stammer från korruption eller nepotisme. Och jag lyssnar så kaste lite sån kallt vatten blod på oss också för det att Norge är er ett av världens likaste samfund. Och de likaste samfunden har ofta också den mest rättfärdiga olikheten. Men hvordan blev vi det? Altså, vi har blitt det over noen hundre år ved at vi opprinnelig var et homogent, egalitært samfund, Väldigt høye tillitsnivåer. Väldigt tidlig fick vi en rättsstat som dannet grundlag for att vi kunne ingå noen veldig viktige og velfungerende kontrakter. Vi kunne lage et veldig godt skattesystem, en velfungerende velferdsstat, en veldig velfungerende markedsøkonomi, trepartssamarbeid og så videre. Men dette har tagit oss 150-200 år Och det er ikke bare å overføre disse tingene til et hvilket som helst samfunn, tror jeg. Eh, sånn at eh, vi, jeg tror ikke vi kan liksom, eh, greie oss å få til vekst i privat sektor og næringsutvikling i et fattig land og bidra til det, samtidig uten å akseptere at det er en viss ulikhet. Eh, jeg, jeg kan ikke se noen samfunn. Altså, vi vet att at det var noen kommunistiske samfunn som prøvde å skape full likhet. Det var ikke så veldig vellykket. Men, men ellers så vet jeg ikke om noen demokratisk samfunn. Som, og jeg ser heller ikke det som et gode, full likhet. Mm. For skal du få full likhet, så må du antagelig ty til virkemidler som fjerner mye av friheten vår. Ja. Og vi, skal, vi skal bevege oss inn, vi skal få kommentere på det, vi skal bevege oss inn i Norges rolle i dette, fordi, og i norsk bistandspolitikk, eh, fordi noe av grunnen til at global ulikhet eh, har blitt redusert, altså mellom land i senere år, som du sa, er jo at store folkerike land har beveget seg fra lavinntektsland opp i mellominntektsnivå, og Men så er det sånn at mange av disse store mellominntektslandene huser jo fortsatt veldig mange fattige, og også ekst- noen av de ekstremt fattige. Så ulikhet internt i disse landene er jo, den er veldig høy da. Men skal Norge jobbe med mellominntektsland, for eksempel da, i, I norsk bistand? Fordi vi føler at vi, vi kanskje sitter da på någon gode løsninger hva gjelder omfordeling og egalitære styringsprinsipper og så videre. Eller skal vi jobbe da med de aller fattigste landene, Det er kanskje omfordeling ikke er like relevant fordi kaken i utgangspunktet er såpass liten. Um, dette er egentlig et spørsmål om hvorfor er ulikhet viktig i, I norsk bistand, og, og hvordan skal vi jobbe med tematikken? Um, vi kan begynne, jeg har så lyst til å bare ha en kort ja. kommentar til, ja. til Kristin, for jeg tror bare så det ikke blir en skinndebatt heller, så er det jo, jeg er helt enig med dig. det er ingen som... Um tror jag jobbar för eller har en illusion om en, en full likhet. Eh, eh, men där hvor vi jobbar och de landen och den problematiken vi diskuterar nu handlar om land hvor det är er en enorm och oönskad eh, likhet, ikke sant? Så de tiltakna och det vi bidrar till tänker jag må ha som mål också eh, bidra till mindre ulikhet. Och så handlar det om skal, hvor skal vi då jobba eh, där hvor Norge har en en alltså nog att bidra med. Jag tror jo eh, ikke vi har så mycket att bidra med hvis vi tror att vi på något kan eh, replikere det vi har gjort. Altså, det var under helt andra forhold. Vi, vi får ikke satt upp den där kassa experimentkassa och prøve att utveckla liksom andra land sånn som Norge utvecklat sig till detta samfund vi känner. Så det må ju vara ett helt ant bud på hvordan land ska bli eh, land som respekterar mänskligheter, hvor det är er mindre ulikhet och i det hela tatt. Og jeg, eh, jeg tror jo eh, jag har mer lyst til att snakke om vilka krafter är er det vi ska eh, støtte i olika land och jag tror att vi må jobbe i land hvor det är er stora demokrati och mänsklighets och olikhets och fattigdomsutfordringer det är er både i eh, land som är er i kategori med fattig land och i mellominntäktsland och jag tror det är er, spelar verkligen roll vem är er det vi stöttar vi må törra och stötta de krafterna som är er, eh, reformvilliga som är er kritiska och som tör att ta risiko alltså den risikon som som Gry snackat om 
om i sted, da. Altså, vi har jo partnere som risikerer liv og død i denne kampen for eh, tilgang og, og rettferdighet hver eneste dag. Jeg fikk beskjed i dag morges om at, fra mine kolleger som er i Bol- Colombia nå, om at en av våre partnere ble drept eh, i, for noen timer siden. Eh, og det er jo eh, i kamp for eh, rettigheter, ufolksrettigheter i i Colombia. Så jag tror vi må se på vem vi stöttar eh, och jag tror också det är intressant att diskutera är liksom tiden för dessa enorma enorma initiativen där vi tror hvis vi bara liksom jobbar med infrastruktur eller hvis vi bara jobbar med hälsa eh, tror eh, det ska vi kanske konferensen senare idag också se på dessa mikroinitiativ att vi kanske må göra lite och mindre skritt på flera områden är det som tar oss längst. Men, men det är er, er en lång väg att gå då det är er, det är er också som Lars Lo kollega som la fram rapport här i stad sa att en väldigt viktig sånn, han la jo, i rapporten så lägger han väldigt vekt på politisk vilje och och styresätt eh, som en väldigt viktig faktor för att göra något med olikhet i i land där det är er, er ett stort problem da. men men det är er ju det er, det är er krävande eh, inte minst Altså det er, det er nästan umulig, vil jo noen si det, kritikerne si, men vi ser jo resultater, altså vi som jobber med det vet jo at du kan gå alle disse små skrittene, og ting hadde sett fryktelig mye dårligere ut hvis vi ikke alle disse årene hadde jobbet ja. for den endringen. Kristin skal få kommentere også. Jeg vil bare si at vi har, nå har vi jo drevet med bistand i verden i 60-70 år, og vi har jo ikke akkurat nådd de målene som mange har håpet og trodd, trodd og hatt ambisjoner om. Det er veldig mange gode resultater, men det er også mange resultater som har er uteblitt, og jeg som står litt utenfor bistandsbransjen, eh, synes at det er viktig å huske på det som jeg trodde i hvert fall var kjernen i bistand, nemlig hjelp til selvhjelp. Eh, altså at disse landene skal jo utvikle sig selv, men vi kan ge et bidrag som hjälp til selvhjelp. Og da tänker jeg et par ting som jeg synes er veldig viktig personlig, tror jeg er veldig, veldig viktig, er infrastruktur. Eh, jeg selv har hatt gleden av å sitte i styret nord for noen år og eh, bidra til infrastruktur, altså det at man bygger ut energi, fornybar energi da, og at man bygger ut en finansiell infrastruktur, så at vi kan få næringsutvikling og jobbskaping, som er ekstremt viktig. Og så er jeg selv også veldig engasjert i utdanning, det å lage gode, kvalitativt gode utdanningssystemer. Men igen, det er jo ikke noe vi kan gi dem og finansiere på varig basis. Det er jo noe som disse landene selv har interesse av å, å, å bygge opp. Men det å da etablere mekanismer som gör at du så å si belønnes for att satse på utdanning, det tror jeg kan være veldig viktig. Og det er jo vanskelig fordi... Utdanning er jo typisk noe som du ikke ser for avkastning av i gåsøyene før på 20, 30, 40, 50 år. Så det er vanskelig når du sitter og er finansminister i et fattig land og prioriterer det, men det er ekstremt viktig. Men du, du, er, du er ikke et representant for uh, NGO'ene her, men Nei. du er jo samtidig leder av Tenketak, og du er jo glad i sivilsamfunnet, og synes ikke du også det er viktig å støtte opp under sivilsamfunn i samfunn som, uh, eller i hvert fall sivilsamfunnsbevegelser som ønsker å endre på veldig svært ulike Ja, eller maktforhold som er svært ulike, for eksempel? Jo, altså problemet i bistand som jeg oppfatter er at det er nesten, altså alt virker viktig. Eh, problemet er bare at, mitt inntrykk er at når vi får en ny utviklings- eller bistandsminister, så kommer de med sine hjertebarn, og så tar man ikke vekk når man legger på noe mer på toppen, og til slut så er det så mange formål eh, at eh, for mig så virker det litt sånn at hvis man prøver att gå efter alt, så risikerer man man ikke går godt nok efter noe. Gry, du skulle få kommentere oss på det. Ja, der er vi jo veldig enige, egentlig, fordi at det, det er jo litt av det problemet vi ser også, at det kommer eh, norske politikere in med sine hjertebarn som de vil investere, og de varierer. Eh, og det er tematiske prioriteringer, mens selv til selvhjelp er jo egentlig å støtte opp om folks egen agenda for endring. Og støtte opp under de som kan presse på myndighetene, mobilisere, engasjere befolkningen, få et demokratisk samfund på plats där du faktiskt kan pressa igenom ändringar som du definierar selv. Eh, vår agenda går väldigt mycket på vad är er det vi vill att de ska göra eller vad er det vi vill göra i biståndet men vi borde göra mycket mer hvis vi ska jobba med intern olikhet i land eh, med att se på vad är er det folk selv mener ska till för att få till ändring och hvordan kan vi stötta dem i den kampen för ändring. Ja, 
Jeg har lyst til å stille, vi, vi, vi nærmer oss slutten, men jeg har lyst til å stille dere spørsmål på slutten litt mer konkret også, ikke bare hvem vi skal støtte og så videre. Og for i Norge og en del europeiske land så vet vi ganske godt hva som driver ulikhet og sosiale forskjeller, og vi vet også en del om hva som skal til for å gjøre noe med det. Altså vi, har, vi kan føre en debatt da, med et ganske høyt presisjonsnivå, eh, fordi vi har utredning, vi har forskning eh, og så videre, vi har gode registerdata blant annet og så videre, men vi vet alt fra liksom, barnehagesektoren, hvor viktig det er, litt arbeidsmarkedet, Nav, skattepolitikk og så videre. Når vi løfter dette opp til globale spørsmål og, og, og bistand, så, som ulikhet har slått inn i det, så, så er det jo ofte et eh, ganske mye høyere abstraksjonsnivå på den debatten, og vi har ikke et like godt kunnskapsgrunnlag. Så da lurer jeg på, vet vi helt konkret hva, hvilke konkrete tiltak vi bør gjøre for, eh, eller sette i gang for å gjøre noe med ulikhet? Og hvor, hvor skulle vi i så fall begynt? Eh, Linn? Nei, jeg tror hvis noen hadde kunnet svart deg klart på det, så hadde vi, det hadde vært kjempefint. Men der er vi ikke helt. Det er heller ikke one magic bullet, er jeg sikker på, som skal til. Men hvis jeg på en måte skulle velge en sånn inngang, så er det, jeg tror vi er enige om at bistand virker, men ikke all bistand. <laughs> og vi vet ganske mye om hva som har virket til nå, og så må vi jo teste og finne ut hva er det vi tror kan virke fremover. Og jeg tror heller ikke, som Kristin var inne på, eh, bistand til utdanning er helt eh, nødvendig. Eh, og, men hvordan den bistanden til utdanning foregår, den kan vi justere masse. Eh, og det vi, vi i hvert fall vet er at selv om kanskje store globale fond kan være effektive for å få pengene flyttet fra store donorer og til land, så er jo ingenting så politisk som utdanning. Så hvordan eh, pensum blir, hvem som underviser, hvordan et land faktisk velger å sette opp sitt utdanningssystem, vad de forsker på, hvilken kunnskap man faktisk velger å produsere da, om ulikheter, om situasjonen i det landet som skal danne grunnlag for eh, de politiske beslutningene som tas der. Det mener jeg er helt nødvendig å fortsette å satse på. Og da må du også eh, bruke penger på de som eh, kjemper seg makt for å komme fram til bordet. <laughs> Og den der saying om at if you're, if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu, tenker jeg er liksom greit å ha med seg inn i dette. Greit. Da får 30 sekunder til Kristin og 30 sekunder til deg. Til ja, jeg vil bare si at jeg tror i fattig land så virker god, god utdanning og jobbskaping, det virker der som her for å redusere ulikhet eller forebygge økt ulikhet. Men det er en ting som også er veldig viktig og som er vanskeligere å komme med fra utsiden, og det er solide rettsstater. Altså det at vi har en rettsstat, det skaper mye større rettferdighet både i økonomien, i velferdsstaten vår, altså i alle, alle livets forhold, og det er likhetsfremmende. Eh, og det kan man jo ikke, kan jo ikke alle land skryte på seg at de har da. Mm. Gry, vær så god. Mm. Eh, jeg tenker at det er jo, hvis du skal få noen endring på ulikhet, så må det gjennomsyre alt det vi gjør. Så vi vil jo anbefale at vi får en stortingsmelding på ulikhet i, i bistanden. Eh, og vi, vi anbefaler at for eksempel da, vi jobber med opp mot Verdensbanken, FN-systemet, det burde også da gjennomsyre den deltagelsen og støtten som vi gir. At vi, det er det vi må på en måte promotere at den bistanden som gis har en uli, eh, ulikhetsreduserende virkning. Og vi mener jo også at det må for eksempel inn i næringslivssatsingen, som vi på en måte tar litt som for gitt at det skal ha en ulikhetsreduserende effekt, men det har ikke det hvis man ikke setter noen klare krav. Tusen hjertelig takk. Svart tema, men det var det vi rakk. Tusen takk for at dere kom. Ja, jeg synes dere rakk mye. Tusen takk for en veldig engasjerende og klok samtale. Gry Ballestad, Line Hegna, Kristin Klemmet og samtaleleder Nikolai Hegertun. Og han kommer tilbake om litt for å lede et annet spennende panel som kommer i neste bolk eh, under temaet fra kull til null utslipp. Eller, for å være mer presis, from coal to zero emissions, challenges and solutions for developing countries. Men før det tar vi en god pause. Vi ses klokka elve.
Welcome back. Welcome back to the 2022 NORAD conference. The previous session was all about poverty and inequality. Now, we'll be tackling climate change and the need for a global energy transmission. To give us an overview, Director General of NORAD, Bordvega Soliel, is back. Thank you, great to be back with you. Uh, energy is the very foundation of the modern world, from transport to production to cooking food for your family, even managing a society through a pandemic. Everything requires energy. In 1709, uh, Abraham Darby discovered how to smelt iron ore using a purified form of coal. And since, coal and later oil and gas have become the major energy source globally. Production and use of fossil energy is by far the dominant source of CO2 emissions. And that is why the global energy transition from fossil to renewable energy is the dominant climate solution. In many developing countries, and specifically in sub-Saharan Africa, the challenge in the decades to come is a double challenge. The first is access, because energy isn't for everyone. Globally, at least 700 uh, million people, or, or approximately 800 million people, do not have access to electricity. About 600 million of them live in sub-Saharan Africa. At the same time, the continent's population is booming, and with it, the use of energy. The International Energy Agency projects a doubling of energy use on the continent by 2040. So uh, uh, for Africa, uh, increased access to energy is essential. The second channel is what kind of energy that will be offered. If we are to have any chance of meeting the goals set out in the Paris Agreement, we cannot rely on fossil fuel to meet the future energy needs of the African continent, like any continent. The most obvious solution is not in front of us, it, it's above us. And it also shows to, 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 uh, to, uh, or serves to show what I call the African solution paradox. Long term, almost every focus point in the same direction. Solar energy will be the dominant source of energy in uh, the energy mix by 2100. We are in the solar century, and 40% of the global potential for solar energy is on the African continent. Still today, only 1.3% of installed energy is in Africa. Actually, the United Kingdom, you know, uh, the island where the weather is always cloudy and gray, has more installed capacity than the whole of the African continent. So Africa is the continent of the future, when it comes to renewable energy, but it is not the continent of the present. And that's where NORAD and so many others come in. By using grants to support investments in energy and energy systems, we can contribute to a real vendepunkt, an energy game changer. NORAD supports guarantee measures to increase reinvestments in renewable energy. An example uh, is the Norwegian company Empower, which has invested in solar to cover the energy use of the Ghanaian company Miniplast, which I've visited myself. This year, we will also be creating and implementing the program Energy for, the develop for Development for the Norwegian government, a program to support institutions that are vital for a functioning energy system. And there is an enormous need for clean cooking solutions. At least 2.5 billion people worldwide cook over open fire. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, firewood is fetched from the forest, and firewood alone makes up 20% of the deforestation. This has a devastating effect on people's health. Close to 4 million people, including almost 400,000 children under five, die from indoor pollution every year. This is not new, but new solutions that you will hear about soon bring hope of a game changer. Whether for clean cooking or kickstarting solar initiatives, we want to spend more of our resources in a way that can catalyze private capital to this double challenge in the future. And that's what this part of today's program is about, game-changing energy solutions. NORAD has entered into a cooperation with the International Energy Agency to explore solutions 
to the African double energy challenge. Better access, clean energy. Better access, clean energy. Thank you, Bord Vega Soliel. So, no wonder the next topic is Africa Energy Outlook 2022. And um, in his introduction, Mr. Soliel mentioned the cooperation with the International Energy Agency. And today, we're pleased to have Executive Director Fatih Birol with us. He's been named by Forbes magazine as one of the most influential people on the world's energy scene. He chairs the World Economic Forum's Energy Advisory Board and serves on the UN Secretary, Secretary General's Advisory Board on Sustainable Energy for All. Dr. Birol will be speaking on how Africa can decarbonize and join the global energy transition. Afterwards, he will engage in conversation with Elisabeth Clements, head of the section for energy in NORAD's Department for Climate and Environment. Dr. Fatih Birol, we're glad to have you here. Welcome. Uh, very many thanks for uh, inviting me uh, to your event and the uh, Greetings to our uh, Norwegian colleagues and uh, all the other uh, colleagues, friends, following this event across the uh, world. Thank you uh, very much from the International Energy Agency headquarters in Paris. So I am very happy to uh, join you to talk about uh, Africa uh, energy, clean energy, uh, reaching our uh, global and regional uh, climate goals. But uh, before that, I wanted to register uh, something. The, at the IEA, we work on energy access over uh, two decades, almost 22 years. And the first step of this journey uh, to work on energy access has started in cooperation uh, with uh, NORAD. So I wanted to take uh, NORAD for this long-term relationship between uh, IEA and uh, uh, themselves. Now, uh, when we look at this issue more than 20 years uh, ago, there are 1.7 billion people who had no access to uh, electricity. And when we look at the numbers today, it is uh, more than half. And there are some very good uh, examples. We have seen China, for example, huge, huge, huge uh, success story in China, followed by India. Uh, India recently in 2019 is uh, now almost 100% uh, uh, full electrification. And uh, also Bangladesh, the major achievement as well. There are many good uh, news. Uh, still, when I remember 20 years ago, a, a map we made for our slides where are the problems? It was China, it was in India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. The problem with Sub-Saharan Africa remains. It is now uh, the deep center of uh, access. One out of two people in 21st century has no access to electricity. Of course, it is not uh, acceptable. And this is one of the two hallmarks of energy poverty. And the other one is, of course, not having uh, access to uh, modern uh, cooking uh, uh, devices. So uh, the, uh, this is definitely a very worrying uh, trend. Uh, one out of two people having no access in uh, Africa. And this has not only implications for energy, but economy, social life, political stability, as it goes on and on and on. So, uh, with the, uh, when we look at the trend in Africa, in fact, we are following year by year, since 2013, we have seen, we have been seeing a rather declining of energy access numbers. Uh, this is very good. More and more people would have access to energy the energy the lack of electricity numbers were uh, declining, a very good trend. But uh, with the COVID, we have seen it is now reversed, bad news. So uh, looking at these issues, uh, we have uh, thought at the IEA, let's make an 
a new Africa energy outlook. This was our uh, 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 plan, and I was very happy that the, uh, uh, our colleagues in NORAD gave us a hand here. In this Africa Energy Outlook, we are working together uh, with the uh, African Union uh, Commission as well as uh, uh, UNECA, and but also we have in several African countries, uh, we have 20 experts on the ground giving us uh, a lot of support and are, are able to work in our job. The team is conducting this uh, work. So what do we want to do with this uh, work. We want to come up with uh, recommendations, concrete policy uh, suggestions, especially focusing on the next 10 years. Uh, A, how we can achieve universal electricity access and clean cooking uh, uh, by 2030. This is number one. Number two, how uh, we can uh, have the, the African countries can reach the NDC goals climate goals, why we are seeing about 50% of increase in the economy in those uh, countries. So how do we fulfill these two uh, major uh, conditions? The access to energy and making it clean, reaching our climate goals while the economy is growing. This is very important for the International Energy Agency, while the economy is growing, while the prosperity of the African people are increasing. Now, uh, my colleagues are working on the report. The report will come uh, uh, mid this year. But when I look at the report, if I have to pick up two, three th uh, points I wanted to share with you, which I think are uh, critical. What is the fault line of reaching these targets in Africa? In Africa with the, a, a full uh, access to energy, economy is growing and the energy is uh, uh, clean. This is the investment. Investment in clean energy is, for me, the fault line of uh, the entire uh, the uh, energy uh, question in Africa. According to our uh, numbers, the, when I look at the current clean energy investment trends, they have to increase by a factor of five if we were to reach this uh, our uh, targets that the World Energy Outlook puts uh, uh, together. And of course, there are major challenges here. One of them I can tell you, the cost of capital. Cost of capital in uh, Africa is about seven times higher than, for example, in the uh, Western uh, uh, markets. Uh, so, which is uh, definitely uh, not a good news to get the private uh, capital. And um, I'm going to Egypt in a few weeks of time, uh, uh, having meetings with the, uh, with the president, government officials, and so on. And Egypt is this year uh, 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 holding the COP27 presidency. I will tell my Egyptian uh, uh, colleagues, I'm sure you will get a lot of suggestion Please put this under your list, this priority, that priority. My main suggestion to them, I'm sure they will look at the list of issues, and some of them will come from COP26, from Glasgow, some of them will be past the uh, COP28 in the in, 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 uh, United Arab Emirates. But if I was Egypt, I would put the how we can achieve a mobilizing clean energy investment in Africa is the number one priority, looking at our numbers as it is a, a enabler. The uh, solar, huge potential. Wind, huge potential. Hydropower, huge potential. The hydropower capacity today in entire uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is as uh, much as uh, uh, what you have in your beautiful uh, country of Norway. The Director General uh, 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 gave a very good example on solar that uh, we have been saying in, since uh, some time. Uh, he mentioned UK, but I'll give you another number. Just think of the world map. Okay. Belgium, Sub Saharan Africa. Sub Saharan Africa, where you have the 40% of the global 
solar potential and the solar power capacity in Belgium is about 50% higher than the entire sub-Saharan Africa put together. It is incredible. It is one of the uh, one of the most tragic numbers I ever uh, uh, witnessed in the uh, energy world. Huge solar potential. Second, very cheap, and third, uh, as uh, we uh, said several times, half of the continent has no access to uh, power. So therefore, solar is uh, very important together with the others. But also, uh, I want to note uh, that in our report, we will also keep an eye on the, another issue, another potential that Africa has uh, a lot for the immediate and the longer term future, which is the critical minerals. Uh, which are very important for the clean energy transition. Electric cars, uh, wind mills, solar panels, and so on. Africa is very rich uh, there. And we will also, in our report, uh, not only the, the electricity part of the uh, energy poverty issue, but we will also look at the issue of the clean cooking, where uh, we analyze the role of uh, LPG in uh, detail. So to sum up uh, our report, uh, thanks to the uh, support of uh, uh, NORAD uh, and in good cooperation with the African Union uh, Commission and UNECA, is coming uh, mid this year with concrete suggestions on the uh, access to energy 2030, full access to energy by 2030. And the second, while the economy prospers, how we can make sure that they, uh, uh, the choice of the government's utilities are the clean energy sources and putting the, uh, the, a lot of discussion on the nerve center of the problem, how to mobilize clean energy investments in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Once again, many thanks to you for inviting me here and uh, moreover, Many thanks to uh, NORAT uh, for the great uh, cooperation. Thank you. Dr. Brawl, again, welcome to the NORAD conference. And thank you for presenting the initial findings from the upcoming report. To start off our conversation, I'd like to ask why the executive director of the International Energy Agency one of the most influential people, according to the Times 100 list, is taking the time to talk to us today about increasing access to energy in developing countries. Why do I take the time to talk to, about uh, Africa? Because it is the most important uh, thing in my job uh, <laughs> uh, today, yesterday, and uh, tomorrow. So. Uh, in fact, when I uh, became the, uh, many Norwegian colleagues know, when I became the head of the IEA in 2015, uh, I made a major change in the uh, IEA strategy uh, under the motto of opening the doors of the IEA to emerging and developing uh, world. As a result of that, uh, the international judges, which has been uh, 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 having the members only from uh, Europe, uh, North America, and Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, is in the last few years we have many new member governments of the IEA family, ranging from Africa to uh, Brazil, from Brazil to Indonesia, from India uh, to Colombia, Mexico, and uh, so this is one thing and the. Second thing is, again, going to NORAD. Um, I, I remember exactly 22 years ago, uh, uh, I was in a conference, uh, again, one of the big uh, summits, people were talking about millions of people have no access to electricity. The other person says it is a major problem for the humanity that the, uh, so many people have no access to electricity. 
that I taught myself. At that time, I was the head of the World Energy Outlook team at the IEA, and we were only five people in the entire World Energy Outlook team. And I taught myself, if somebody, if the world takes this issue uh, seriously, first we have to measure it. What is this millions? What is this so many people? And I wanted to start a project uh, to every year to see how many people have access to electricity and how many don't, and next year what changed in which country. And of course, we didn't have resources, and I went to uh, NORAD. I knew their work, and uh, a good friend of mine at that time working for NORAD, uh, Peter Nore, I said, Peter, can we get some support from you, from NORAD, to start with a project uh, like this? And he was kind enough to, uh, through NORAD to support us. And since 22 years, International Energy Agency, every year, takes this as a priority. And country by country, we are uh, looking at how many people have access to electricity. And now, if they work, if the, those numbers are around, uh, from the UN Secretary General to the, uh, to the presidents, uh, the, the CEOs, thought leaders, uh, economists around the world, if they are using these numbers, this is thanks to the great support of uh, NORAC at that time. These numbers are used and produced by uh, many people now, which is a very good uh, uh, news. And, but I want to see Africa even going beyond uh, being in the international uh, uh, fora. I was telling you the colleague the other day, uh, because we are working with the several G20 countries. Uh, this year with Indonesia, next year with uh, uh, Italy, uh, last year, uh, next year with India, last year with Italy. I was always thinking, the, I'm very happy to see many European colleagues and the European uh, Commission there, and why not making G20, uh, from G20 to G21, and uh, having the African uh, Union being a part of this uh, debate, I thought it would be very good to have the African leaders becoming uh, the part of the major uh, international uh, uh, fora uh, today. So these are some thoughts about Africa and some uh, memories, uh, good memories uh, with uh, uh, Nora and once again, very many thanks for all your support. So we're a little less than eight years away from 2030, by which time we should reach universal energy access. And we'll focus on cooking in a little bit, but first on to the electricity. And as you mentioned, we need to measure it. And according to the IEA data, around 150 million people gained access in Africa over the past decade. And we need to increase this rate by almost five times in the next eight years to provide an additional 710 million people with access. Now, how do we achieve this, and, and how can limited grant funding from agencies like NORAD most effectively mobilize renewable energy, which you uh, also said initially is just so critical in this topic? First of all, uh, I believe Africa, uh, when we look at the development, uh, economic development uh, history of uh, different parts of the world, when you look at, for example, uh, Europe, uh, you know, uh, America, uh, China, they had different phases of their economic development fueled by different sources of uh, energy. And they all went through a phase of coal-driven economic growth. It is the uh, Europe, the US, and, uh, uh, and this is China. Africa uh, may well skip that uh, phase. and. Uh, uh, why? Because they have a lot of uh, other sources, and second, those sources are very, very cheap, uh, and therefore I see it will be a uh, coming. Now, we have the potential, uh, a renewable potential, and uh, we have the, the political will in many, if not all, African countries to make most out of this potential. Uh, 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 the uh, bringing electricity and the clean uh, cooking to uh, their citizens. What is missing is the right policies at home and uh, international support for uh, this uh, 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 journey to bring the uh, lots of solar, wind, hydropower and other energy sources. Maybe natural gas in uh, some uh, countries to power their economies. 
So uh, the missing link here is the uh, investments. As I mentioned before, the cost of capital is very high. Therefore, we need certain instruments here. And one of them is, in my view, the most important one, in my view, the, uh, um, uh, the MDBs, uh, the market and development banks, in my view, should clean energy investment as a number one priority in their lending processes. It is not like that now. And I uh, urge all the governments uh, who are in the boards of those uh, uh, organizations to make sure that this is a key priority. And also, there are also uh, organizations like uh, NORAC, and I think your support uh, will be also uh, important uh, in terms of uh, being a, a catalyst for the private uh, money. Of course, keeping an eye on the uh, governance uh, issues there. Uh, it will be uh, critical. So I see uh, two big uh, uh, players here to address this fault line of the problem, which is the mobilizing clean energy investments. One, domestic right policies, putting the policies there. Uh, and the second, the international uh, support, uh, ranging from the uh, multi development banks to the bilateral and the aid institutions such as uh, NORA in order to play a catalyst uh, role to get the investments there. If we can disclose investments, the potential is huge because demand will grow. Uh, the sources are, uh, resources are there. And if we can disclose investments through these uh, instruments, it will be uh, definitely very, very good news. Thank you. Um, now, the EU recently announced that natural gas, you just touched upon it, may be considered a transitional green energy. But given the climate crisis that we're facing, uh, not everyone is supportive of financing new fossil fuel infrastructure. Could you elaborate a just a little bit more on what you see the role of fossil fuels in sub-Saharan Africa to be? Uh, of course. <clears throat> Now, uh, first of all, I want to make something clear. Uh, the, uh, the Europeans, Americans, Japanese, uh, I don't know, the, the developed uh, countries. The Africa's contribution to the cumulative CO2 emissions is uh, less than uh, 2%, almost nothing. So we have to put this everything in a context, uh, uh, first of all, this is number one. And number two, uh, the Africa's top priority is economic development. And when we have the, uh, all these cheap renewable energy sources ranging from solar, the most important being the most important one, to hydropower, onshore wind, offshore wind, uh, in some cases geothermal, uh, they are all, uh, we have to make the most out of this. But there may be some uh, uh, areas uh, that the countries may well use uh, natural gas for fueling their economic growth. I can, nobody can convince me, to be honest with you, nobody can convince me that in Mozambique they are forbidden to use natural gas. Rather huge part of the population have no access to electricity, and they have just uh, natural gas uh, resources. Of course, they should use, but they should do it in a way that they should know that it is, um, I'm talking about other countries, not only uh, and, and Mozambique, the, the infrastructure should be built in a way that it will not be long-lived, for example. Secondly, a big problem in, in Africa, many countries that maintain emissions need to be minimized, if not uh, nullified. And third, this infrastructure uh, should be, whatever we build there, should be ready for uh, using a uh, repurposing, for, for example, hydrogen and uh, others. So in this context, there may be uh, ways to make use of uh, natural gas. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't link to uh, the EU or other. EU is different. Africa is different. Africa needs economic growth, and nobody, nobody, including the IEA or this organization, that organization, shouldn't uh, tell Africa, use this, don't use this. Of course, we can give some suggestions, but again, 
if Mozambique is, I just give Mozambique as an example, there's a huge amount of people who have no access to electricity, and, and next door, if they have their own uh, uh, gas, natural gas resources, of course, they should make the most out of it. With consideration of the things I mentioned to you, the hydrogen, methane emissions, and the limited uh, years of infrastructure uh, investments uh, there. But um, I, I should mention that the coal is out of question, and uh, we are uh, leaving coal uh, behind us anyways. Coal is, uh, from economic point of view, even from economic point of view, it is not a, a good investment in Africa at all. And perhaps I should mention one more thing. I'm just remembering now the LPG. So LPG is a critical one, uh, especially when it comes to uh, clean cooking. I think we should not forget the LPG, uh, which can also help to improve the quality of life of uh, many Africans and uh, Asians and Latin Americans as well. Yes, thank you. Uh Thank you, Dr. Brill. Um, you just transition now over to the topic of, uh, of cooking. And indeed, 2.5 billion people in the world lack access to modern energy to prepare their meals. Dr. Brill, how important is this part of the SDG 7 to you? And can you, think, can you describe a little bit more how you think is the best way to achieve that? <clears throat> Thank you. This is also a very great uh, topic because uh, even in the excess discussions around the world, the, the overwhelming attention of excess is focusing on the electricity, which is very important. But there is also uh, this clean cooking. And uh, clean cooking, uh, again, a topic that IEA has been working since uh, two decades. Uh, my colleague, uh, Lara Kozi, would remember uh, my discussions with her since many years. She is the, uh, our chief energy model who is in charge of this our Africa work. Now, uh, when we look at the clean cooking, it's a matter of mainly the issue of uh, women and children. And it is one of the top three uh, reasons for premature deaths around the world. In most of the uh, countries, especially in, uh, in Africa, because of the respiratory diseases it causes. Second, many women not only they are better affected uh, health-wise, losing a lot of time to collect wood to bring home and uh, for cooking. Now, I was thinking, and there is a, in, a, you mentioned Europe, there is a lot of discussion in Europe, which I fully agree, but I fully agree, how many women should be represented in the boards of the companies, which is very good. We have to increase it. We are trying to do it in the IEA. We are uh, not better at all at uh, yeah, today. The 50% IS staff now, as of today, is women, 50% uh, men. But I was thinking, there is a lot of attention there, rightly so, in these issues. Why there is not enough attention? Hmm. African women losing a lot of time to collect wood, therefore deprived from the social life, deprived from the economic life, Deprived from the education uh, 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 opportunities mm. and collecting wood and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, being exposed to this health issue. So therefore, I think this is a key issue, it's a gender issue in my view, as important as the number of women, how many companies have uh, women uh, uh, executives in their boards, as important as that. And the, uh, we, there are many uh, suggestions we come in our uh, work, but the LPG is a very good, uh, uh, one of the very good ways to uh, address this issue, providing clean cooking purposes. I suggest many colleagues to uh, follow the, what happened in India, uh, the Ushwala program in India. I think they were a very successful program uh, there the, uh, in India, and the many countries may uh, well get inspiration uh, from that. So this, this will be one of the key topics in our uh, forthcoming report in Africa Energy Outlook, how to provide clean cooking uh, in the best way, best way meaning uh, providing support for the women and children for their economic and social lives, uh, and at the same time providing the least cost options, but at the same time providing uh, uh, the economic growth. Dr. Brawl? Thank you so much for sharing your insights today on the challenges of combating climate change and achieving sustainable energy for all. 
And of course, we look forward to the IEA's report on Africa's energy outlook to be published in the second quarter of this year. Thank you very much, Will. Yes, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence, Fatih Birol and Elizabeth Clements. Uh, this was an inspiring conversation. So we're happy Elizabeth will also be staying with us to moderate the next panel on innovation and growth in the energy sector. And what a panel. Hanan Marwa is CFO of Circle Gas and has 20 years of experience in mergers, acquisitions and private equity. Since 2012, she's focused on the African energy sector, not least as board member of the National Electricity Utility of Cameroon, ENEO, and the power company of Virunga National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Wilde Grön Larsen is a senior vice president of Exfin. As part of the team Renewable Energy and Industry, SME and Midcorp, she works primarily with transactions in Africa and other emerging markets. She also has wide international experience spanning finance and accounting. In the panel is also Xavier Pierluca, managing partner of Enabling Capital. As a global investment professional, he's structured and raised several funds in access to energy, microfinance, fintech, SME finance, and healthcare. So, finally, the panel welcomes CEO and founder of Burn Manufacturing and the founder of Burn Design Lab, Peter Scott. In 2010, he was chosen as one of the top 100 global thinkers by Foreign Policy magazine. He's also recognized as a global leader in cook stove commercialization. So, take a look at this. Mother, surely you must make sure your family is safe. Your kids get proper education. Your family eat properly. This is my sixth year of using the cocoa. It is very safe. It, the smoke very reduced. I'm spending a quarter of the money compared to the old stove. You can buy books, you can maybe take your kids for a trip they can enjoy. Yeah, and that's a health family. I think so. It will help. <laughs> I really like it. Hanan Mawa. You represent Circle Gas, a company founded about three years ago with more than 150,000 customers. Peter Scott, you have founded and developed the company Burn, headquartered in Kenya, which has become one of the largest companies in the clean cooking sector. 
Can you please tell us about your motivation to engage in this sector and the companies that you represent? And let's please start with Hanan. Talking about um, the issues of clean cooking and really um, the statistic that stands out most to me is that more people die each year from indoor air pollution caused by AIDS uh, uh, from clean cooking, from the lack of access to clean cooking than die from AIDS, malaria and TB combined. Mm. Uh, the lack of access to clean cooking is really one of the great intractable problems, development problems of our age. Um, and of course, the trade in charcoal is a major driver of deforestation. And we know uh, it's already been mentioned how many people around the world are stuck in this terrible situation. My own background is that I came from the electricity sector, which has already been mentioned on this um, as being an urgent development priority. I've been working with investment funds that focus on electricity, distribu electricity distribution. And I never thought about clean cooking as an area where there could be promising companies, commercially viable companies. I always thought it was a bit of a no-hoper industry and, and um, probably not something that I could ever get involved in. And then I heard about Circle Gas, a pay-as-you-go LPG distribution company um, that's backed by the Kenyan mobile telephone company Safaricom. Um, and, and honestly, I'd never thought about LPG as being really the solution to this problem. Um, uh, but as Dr. Brohl mentioned, it is increasingly clear that it is a major part of uh, how to achieve clean cooking around the world. I realized uh, when I came across Circle Gas that there were four things that had changed recently, which really opened up the possibility for a sustainable commercial proposition to expanding clean cooking access. Cooking with gas, um, a clean burning fuel, is in many countries reserved for the rich and middle classes. It's a highly aspirational fuel and people want to use it, but in many cases cannot afford to cook with gas, which is actually cheaper in many markets, but they cannot afford the cost of the upfront equipment. However, the four things that have changed are, number one, the widespread use of mobile money. Number two, the invention of the pay-as-you-go smart meter for gas. Number three, supportive government policy, which helps um, open up the price difference between clean and dirty fuels. And fourth, the fast growth of dense urban populations. The combination of these four things mean that a pay-as-you-go gas cooking business targeted at urban areas is now viable. Those trapped in poverty who could not otherwise afford a gas cylinder can now pay for gas one meal at a time. At Circle Gas, we are committed to fighting climate change and we're in the process of registering carbon credits generated by our business uh, because when a customer moves from cooking with charcoal to cooking with gas, there is a significant reduction in net emissions. For our customers, gas is the only scalable way for them to access clean cooking. And our goal is to expand that access as much as possible until a fully renewable fuel source is available. Mm. Lack of access uh, to clean cooking, as Dr. Brohl mentioned, primarily affects women and children. And I believe this is one of the reasons that it has, has been such a neglected area compared to say electricity access. So this has been a huge personal motivation for me. Thank you. That's great, Hanan, thank you. And what about you, Peter and, uh, and Bern? Sorry, do we have sound? Oh, sorry, I thought I was on. <laughs> there okay. you are, I can hear you now. Apologies. Apologies for that. It's a great pleasure to be here and glad that the world is looking at clean cooking solutions. You know, I've spent my whole uh, adult life working on clean cooking. So when I first, when I was 20 and I went to DRC, I saw deforestation uh, in Congo and got down and, on my knees and cried and said I would commit my life to saving forests mm -hmm. across the world. So uh, jump forward to 2010 and I launched uh, Burn Design Lab and Burn Manufacturing uh, to really design the world's most fuel efficient uh, biomass stoves mm. and then to manufacture those uh, locally. So uh, since 2010, Burn has become, it seems like it's breaking a little bit. Are you guys still getting me? I, I can I'm hear in my you. Background. I can hear you. Okay, good. 
I'm in the factory, and so uh, sometimes the connection's a little bit bad. So, uh, so we have now become the largest cookstove company in the world. We've uh, made, produced and sold over 1.2 million units, and I think, um, and so now we're on track to really scale and actually do over 1.2 million units this year alone. So we make about 70,000 units a month now. By the middle of this year, we'll do 200,000 units a month. By the end of this year, we'll do 400,000 units a month. So it's really we're in an incredible uh, growth phase for the sector and, and for burn. And uh, so I think it's it's interesting. You know, for a long time, the clean cookstove sector was seen as being sort of problematic or dysfunctional. You know, Hannah alluded to that, that it seemed like it, even though there was this huge need and huge opportunity, no one had really, uh, really had addressed it. But we've had a number of independent studies of burn stoves that said, you know, one forty dollar burn stove can have a thousand dollars of benefit to society when you add up the carbon benefit, the uh, household savings, the reduction in health costs. So it's an incredible IRR for a country as well as for a household. So one household might have a benefit of two, uh, you know, two hundred ninety six percent IRR increase. So Burn kind of built itself on biomass stoves, but the real future is in electric. And so uh, that is the exciting opportunity. You know, people often talk about the lack of electric uh, access on the continent, but the reality is urban uh, markets have very high access to electricity. And cooking with electricity is actually the cheapest form of cooking uh, on the continent. So cheaper than LPG, charcoal, wood, um, uh, paraffin. So the real opportunity in the future is going to be uh, on electric, and that will be supported by carbon, by pay as you go. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we're very excited to roll out a whole new line of not just biomass, but also uh, also electric. Really interesting right. indeed. Um, so obviously, uh, financing to grow newly founded companies um, like yourselves is critical. So in this upcoming film, we will see how barriers to financing could potentially be addressed from a new fund. Today, 900 million people in Africa still use inefficient stoves and fuels for cooking, leading to 700,000 premature deaths for a degradation and climate change. Meeting the UN's Sustainable Development Goals will require reaching the long elusive goal of bringing access to clean cooking for all. Fortunately, clean cooking solutions are becoming more affordable, in demand by consumers and commercially viable due to innovative new technologies and business models. At the same time, Africa's clean cooking market is still nascent and reaching the SDGs by 2030 will require a quantum leap in investments for developing, testing and scaling new business models. We won't be able to bridge this investment gap through public funding alone. Attracting more private financing is required to build a vibrant clean cooking market. This calls for new and creative uses of blended finance that can stimulate private sector investment. As a response to this challenge four years ago, the Clean Cooking Alliance set out to develop a fund that would blend capital from pension funds and other commercial investors with concessional capital from development institutions and in doing so, serve as a model for future investment vehicles. With a market opportunity driven strategy, the Spark Plus Fund would deploy primarily debt, but also equity and quasi equity instruments to fill a critical gap in the financing landscape. Spark Plus would take a value chain approach, finding enterprises that manufacture, distribute and finance clean cooking solutions across Sub-Saharan Africa. We partnered with Enabling Capital an impact fund manager with a track record in microfinance and off-grid energy. And together we assembled a stellar team that would structure, fundraise and ultimately manage this pioneering fund. It is with great pleasure that I can announce the imminent launch of Spark Plus Africa Fund with approximately 50 million US dollars and a goal to reach a final capitalization of 70 million US dollars later this year. Investors in Spark Plus are a mix of private sector investors like family offices, foundations, and pension funds. These investors would not have come in were it not for catalytic commitments from the public sector with the African Development Bank serving as the fund's anchor investor and five additional public development finance institutions 
from the US and Europe approving investments in this first of its kind fund dedicated to clean cooking. I would like to thank all of those who've made Spark Plus a reality. We appreciate the generous support of NORAD, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Osprey Foundation, each of whom have supported Spark Plus during its development. We're also honored to have been supported by the International Climate Finance Accelerator and the government of Luxembourg. Pioneering initiatives like Spark Plus would not be possible without the patient and risk tolerant grants from committed donors. The sector needs your continued support to build a vibrant ecosystem for Spark Plus investees to scale and to grow a pipeline of clean cooking businesses. This is an exciting time for investors and innovators in the clean cooking space and for the millions of people in Africa and billions around the world that stand to gain improved health and well-being by adopting the clean stoves and cooking fuels that we all take for granted. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. And I'm delighted that we have Xavier Pierluca, your managing uh, partner at Enabling Capital, which will host the new Spark Plus fund that we just heard about. Could you tell us a little bit more about this, the fund and how it can potentially change the sector? Yeah, no, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having, uh, having me in, in this uh, great panel today. Uh, indeed, uh, it has taken us some, some years not to raise uh, Spark Plus at a level of 50 to 70 million dollars. We're very excited about it, right? I mean, Spark Plus is uh, the result of the cooperation of a very focused not-for-profit, the, the Clean Cooking Alliance and us, no? enabling capital and experienced uh, impact manager. We brought together our experiences and understanding of the sector and the characteristics of investing in emerging markets. Mm. Um, this fund right, has so many potential development impacts today, improving the health and livelihood of millions, increasing energy access, mitigating climate change, improving gender inequality, protecting the forest, etc. What DIMF9 indicated is that you know, the, 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 the key things we've, we've done with Spark Plus has been to align you know, in a blended finance vehicle, um, development finance institutions, public institutions, in order to crowd in commercial investors like family offices and pension funds in order to further the outreach and adoption of clean cooking products and fuels in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, generally, that's a sector that would have struggled not to attract such um, private investment. We believe the fund comes really at the right time now to support the development of the sector, and we're very optimistic, right? I mean, the sector is now composed of real entrepreneurs with a vision for the sector, like Peter, like Anna, no, that have uh, described their business models that are extremely innovative, making use of technology, which is providing quality products and generating affordability as well to low-income customers, such as Pego Solutions, right? Mm. We're very optimistic also because the growth of the carbon market will also act as a formidable driver and subsidy to further the outreach of clean cooking products. Mm. We are aiming to target, as you know, the low and the lower middle-income segments of the population in sub-Saharan Africa. In order to do so, we need to understand you know, that we have to focus our attention on the development and support of companies that are delivering distributed energy solutions. These are the solutions which leapfrog traditional infrastructure that we are all used to, of course. Just as mobile telecom has done you know, for communications in Africa and I would say other developing markets. In the context of clean cooking, Instead of building pipe natural gas infrastructure, we are investing in smart solutions like IoT-enabled LPG, biogas, electric, ethanol or biomass-based bio technologies. These are solutions which truly meet consumer needs and are adapted to the on-the-ground realities of the markets in which they are needed. Mm. Understanding the constraints and hurdles of delivering access to distributed energy solutions Spark Plus will be taking a value chain approach as DIMF9 indicated previously, right? We are targeting all of the key actors of the clean cooking solutions value chains to ensure the sector development. To achieve our mission, we will engage with a mix of financial instruments from long-term equity to shorter term senior secured debt and accelerate the growth of early stage companies that are exhibiting real potential like burn and, and, and circle gas, right? For scale and sustainability. Mm. We can provide and we will provide capital for corporate growth, to finance inventory, receivables, working capital, and we'll be working with manufacturers, distributors, and financing providers as well, or others who are enabling the adoption of clean cooking technologies and fuels. Mm. 
We are very thankful you know, for the support that has been provided to the sector and, and our initiative to date, including our first close investors, as well as public institutions like NORAD, uh, of course. No? We also want to participate as a field builder going forward. And uh, our goal will be to act as a catalyst and ensure that many others, funders, no, will, will follow, will participate to bring the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of private capital that are needed to, to reach universal access. Mm. Thank you, Xavier. So, so um, how important is it for Burn and, and Circle Gas that a fund like Spark Plus has been established? And Peter, would you like to lead, please? Can I? Uh, Here we go, Matthew. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, absolutely. You know, it's it's a, a critical uh, support for Burn to partner with uh, with Spark Plus that we're hoping to be able to announce. Um, a partnership and investment with, with Spark Plus soon. But yeah, for a very long time, there hasn't been funds in the sector because, again, as we talked about before, people saw the sort of dysfunction in the sector. But I guess just to, to back up for one second, is the reason why Burn has been successful is because we're really providing a really strong economic value proposition. Right now, households spend you know, $20 billion a year on charcoal. So just by providing a fuel efficient stove, let's say 50%, you can save families $10 billion across the region. What's changing now is with carbon finance coming in, one stove in one household can generate anywhere from $100 to $500 in carbon revenue. So cook stoves are no longer just, you know, a great opportunity for, you know, improving households, reducing deforestation, reducing indoor air pollution, all of those things, but it's actually now a great financial investment because one stove can generate so much so much carbon revenue. So yeah, the timing of the Spark Plus fund is is great. It's gonna be very catalytic. It's gonna allow burn to scale, which will allow us to then uh, produce more stoves and generate more carbon carbon revenue. So yeah, it, the, the timing could be not more, more perfect. That's, that's a great point, Peter, thank you. Um, the, the economic value proposition is so important. Um, Hanan, what about you? Is, how important is Spark Plus for Circle Gas? Thanks. Um, fundraising for a clean cooking company, however promising, is a big challenge because even for development finance institutions, it sort of falls between the cracks of various funding and investment buckets. Um, clean cooking is not normally considered in the experience set of the large infrastructure funds, even though in our case, we, the funding that we need is for infrastructure um, because it's retail equipment in the home and not a, a power plant, for example, that the infrastructure funds would be used to. It's not considered attractive by the consumer funds, um, even though it's a consumer facing product because it's energy and the consumer base has very low income. And banks normally require much more scale and track record in order to be interested. Impact funds are interested in clean cooking, but they can only usually fund very uh, small ticket investments and have lots of very onerous strings attached. Um, they're also very conditioned by their experiences in investing in solar home systems companies, which have very different business models and customer base to clean cooking companies often. Hmm. The great thing about the talking to the Spark Plus Fund, even though it's still very small, and I hope that it gets much larger, is that they understand and value uh, the clean cooking proposition uh, that Peter uh, mentioned, and, and as did you, Elizabeth. The fact is that cooking with charcoal is more expensive than cooking with gas in our markets, and the market for dirty fuels is a multi-billion dollar market. There is definitely money to be made in selling clean cooking fuel. Thanks. Great, thank you. Vildegrön Larsen, you are senior client executive at Export Finance Norway, and you've worked with small and medium-sized enterprises in Africa to help them secure funding. Having listened to Hanan and Peter describing their businesses and Xavier talking about the new Spark Plus Fund, do you see a role in this sector for Exfin? Um, as a starting point, I would say yes, uh, and I'm also very excited that we, as an expert credit agency, are invited into this discussion. Um, but when I say yes, it also comes with a few buts, unfortunately. Um, I think also that I need to broaden the scope a little bit, not talking about just um, cooking solutions, mm -hmm. but also um, access to clean energy in, in general. Yeah. 
though we can go, you know, we can keep it at a small scale. Um, but, you know, one issue for us is that, of course, we, uh, or XFIN, is an export credit agency. So the financing that we provide is, of course, tied to Norwegian exports. And our mandate is to support Norwegian exporters um, and not development. Um, that said, of course, you know, we also like to see that the transactions that we participate in has a positive impact. And we do score transactions uh, based on their contributions to the sustainable development goals. Um, but of course, given that it's tied to exports, we are a little bit tied in that sense. Um, and of course, another issue for us is that our financing is on commercial terms, meaning that we have to be convinced that a borrower is able to repay a loan in accordance to agreed terms and with interest. And, you know, looking at startup companies, for example, entering into a new market, that's very often challenging. Um, and if you are entering into uh, a market with, with high risk catering consumers and perhaps small businesses, it's very challenging. Um, so I do see that, you know, in that startup phase, what we can offer is usually very limited. However, as soon as you have a proven business model, you have a positive cash flow, um, we are happy to discuss financing, scaling up the business. Mm. And, and we know that the market potential is huge, so that doesn't necessarily have to take that long. Um, of course, given that it's Norwegian content in the transaction. Um, I, I think another issue is also um, that is, is relevant is the business model. Mm. Uh, we cannot provide financing to suppliers or distrib distributors of um, consumer goods such as gas stoves. Um, but if, for example, you are renting out or leasing out um, equipment, it, it can be gas cylinders, it could be perhaps also pay-as-you-go systems, mm. um, but more so perhaps off-grid um, solar solutions to, to small businesses and institutions, etc. Uh, we can provide financing to suppliers based on rental and leasing contracts if they're tied for a few years. Um, and of course, we see this as a change in how businesses operate, that you see more goods and technology being offered as a service rather than being sold as a good. Um, and I also think the benefit, if you manage to combine this business model with financing in low-income countries, um, you also provide access to technology um, to consumers, businesses and institutions that they would not be able to finance if they had to buy it, but they can use it on a, on a rental or, or service basis, uh, which is also what Hanan talked about uh, earlier, you know, giving access. Um, so I think that's a, you know, a positive thing that maybe we can contribute with, and we have been, been doing a few transactions um, you know, under this model. Um, I think another thing that is also sometimes challenging for us is the size of the transaction. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, you know, for, on paper, we don't have a minimum size, but of course it's complicated to put together a cross-border financing transaction. Um, and it can also involve transaction costs, which means that from a practical perspective, usually that, you know, there should be a minimum size uh, of the transaction. Um, of course, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what that size is, depending a little bit, you know, on the type of transaction, the market you're entering into, the country, et cetera. Um, but, but we are happy to look at small-scale transactions as well and see if that's doable. Uh, but of course, if you're moving on to, you know, more larger-scale ways uh, of supplying and providing access to clean energy, talking about perhaps a mini-grid, um, catering for a whole community, including businesses, institutions, households, um, or it can also be perhaps off-grid solar solutions to, to, to businesses and you know, perhaps also consumers, um, then I think export financing can be a very relevant instrument. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, actually, I have one more point, which is, can be useful. I mean, because we are an export credit agency and we don't just provide long-term financing. We can also provide guarantees, you know, and that could be risk mitigating guarantees. Uh, and we can actually also provide risk, um, you know, political risk insurance to investors, also investors investing in commercial businesses in, you know, high risk um, in terms of political risk uh, climates. Um, so I hope also that could be, a, you know, a contributor to making investors more comfortable going into these markets. Yes. Absolutely. I think guarantees are a big part of uh, the solution as well. So I think there's no doubt about the need to increase access to clean energy. We all agree on that. But how should agencies like NORAD and investors 
engage in the sector of clean cooking and small to medium-sized enterprises to really accelerate progress. And can I ask you just to limit your comments to one minute <laughs> each, please? And um, starting with Xavier. Okay, if I cannot unmute myself, it's going to be shorter. <laughs> uh, thanks. The, 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 no, the quantum of funding necessary right, to, to achieve universal access is significant. So we are already greatly appreciative of the financial and strategic support that, that NARAD is already contributing to the sector so far. Um, what we believe right, uh, is that NORAD could play a further role by engaging in the provision of technical assistance to SMEs operating in the clean cooking sector and doing it alongside investors such as SparkPlus. We have found in the past that technical assistance can be more effective if it can be deployed in close coordination with the debt or equity investment, basically. Uh, TA coupled with long-term investment allows to tackle key strategic issues as well as operational improvements uh, with long-term projects no? versus TA that is implemented on a standalone basis, which often result in engaging in much needed but shorter term projects only, right? Yeah. Another aspect, you know, where NORAD can play an important role is in making the pipeline of companies more investable mm. by supporting them with smart subsidies via result-based finance. You know, like the State of Modern Energy Cooking Services report from 2019 from the World Bank shows, in addition to quite a lot of private sector investments, if universal access is to be achieved, um, we will need an even greater amount of public support, right, like smart subsidies. Uh, this is particularly true if the private sector is to reach beyond the urban consumer into less commercially viable markets, right, including those who are extremely poor in rural areas. Thank you, Xavier. Um, Vilda? Yes. Um, uh, well, as I was mentioning and, or talking about before, you know, I think the, the startup phase is very difficult uh, for many companies. And I think in order to, to serve the demand, I think we need a lot of more newcomers coming into this markets on the supplier side. Um, and I have a lot of um, businesses coming to me with great solutions, but they spend years and years trying to, you know, scatter together uh, financing. Um, so I think perhaps if, you know, and, and the Spark Plus Fund uh, was very interesting to hear about, but I think, you know, getting, um, you know, green funds or grants or development grants to provide support in that initial phase um, could be very, very relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, um, and Peter? Yeah, um, I think NORAD can support uh, in, uh, through uh, funding grants and R&D. So we just completed a NORAD grant that helped us launch into West Africa. And so those operations will soon be profitable. So that type of grant for new markets, R&D pilots are super critical. I think to bring uh, cooking to the real bottom of the pyramid in rural areas, where uh, you know people are on you know less than two dollars a day, they're never going to be able to afford a forty dollar product. So it's going to require subsidies, the RBFs, to be able to get that price for a wood stove for the six hundred million people that we're going to continue to rely on wood down to a reasonable price. And we've shown that lowering that price really uh, allows the uptake of super fuel efficient wood stoves to increase. Yeah. The other is for electric appliances. It requires a big asset financing play. So if we want to roll out uh, electric appliances to 2 million households, we'll require about $100 million of asset financing. So, um, but the great thing about it, as I said, is that that can all be backstopped with carbon. So that $100 million investment will actually generate more than a billion dollar return. Right. Thank you. And, uh, and last but not least, Hanan, any advice from you? Thanks. Um, I think NORAD should continue to do what it's already been doing, which is raising the profile of clean cooking as an urgent issue, um, and also the role of LPG in achieving um, wider access to clean cooking, which also NORAD is really a leader in, in doing very evidence-based work in, in understanding the role and the importance of expanding access to LPG. Um, more broadly, um, for grant-making bodies, digital products like the one Circle Gas uses with our smart meter have really rich household-by-household -household usage data and are really well suited to delivering subsidies to, to customers to um, help make something out of reach more affordable. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Now, uh, we have a little bit of time left, not much, but just one final question. Um, this conference is about game-changing solutions. So um, can you just finally limit to one, uh, one minute each um, any game-changing solutions you see in, in this sector? And starting with uh, Vilda. 
Well, um, I'm glad to say that there is innovation happening on the financing side as well. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have been able to provide financing to suppliers of services. You know, and we provide financing upfront based on a service contract entered into for a few years. Um, and I think this is quite groundbreaking, and I haven't seen any other institutions doing it yet. Um, so I think that's great. And that said, there are already um, quite a few initiatives and more focus on finding solutions to finance small-scale off-grid uh, renewable energy um, systems. So I think, you know, perhaps we will see more transactions like that. And I just saw one recently uh, that was a financing a company in Kenya, I think, um, small business providing solar systems to, to homes um, that were able to actually get financing from a development bank for that investment. Great. Thank you. And uh, what about you, Peter? Yeah, I think that the big opportunity is going to be in electric urban on grid. So in the pilots that we've run, that the savings that people get from using electric is roughly about $3 per week, and the cost of ownership is about $2 per week. So we could actually roll out electric cooking across all urban environments using pay-as-you-go and electric appliances, and in 10 years' time, displace all charcoal consumption in urban sub-Saharan Africa. So that, that's the exciting opportunity we see. Wow, great. Um, Hanan? Thanks. Um, at Circle Gas, we have our proprietary software and hardware um, suites, and we are just continuing to invest in R&D and the potential that can come from um, cheaper access to telephones and, and continued features in both phones and our smart meters. So um, uh, we're excited about that. So watch this space. Thanks. <laughs> we will most definitely watch this space. And Xavier? Yeah, no, thank you. I think many, many elements I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embark on have been, have been mentioned already, right? But I think it, it all comes from one key concept, no? that in clean cooking and access to energy, generally speaking, we need to offer clients aspirational products, right? Products that they can desire to own and use. No? And we need to sell these products in ways which are affordable and aligned with our sole cash flow uh, patterns, generally speaking. So just like Unilever discovered right several decades ago with the introduction of sachets you know, of fast moving consumer goods in developing markets, um, you know, which requires small regular payments uh, without the need for large upfront purchases, uh, the same can be achieved right in, in access to energy. So. The off-grid solar sector has already demonstrated that pay-as-you-go business models can generate affordability mechanisms uh, that are necessary to, to broaden right access to lighting products. And, and examples such as Circle Gas are showing that the same is, is true for clean cooking, right? So LPG with smart meters is also particularly suited, uh, but this approach can also be implemented as, as Peter indicated, right, for, for biogas, but electric cooking solutions, no? Um, biomass cookstoves companies are also integrating uh, pay-as-you-go uh, technology uh, into stoves, and uh, we've, we, we've sparked plus basically on, on, on our end, right? We, we're going to focus at opportunities throughout the sector that relies on fuels and fuel sales tech-enabled appliances um, as well. We, we believe, nevertheless, right, that efficient stoves will keep playing an important role, especially with the, the state of the carbon market. Uh, as, as Peter indicated. Um, but, but lastly, as well, I just want to, to mention that, you know, we're speaking about technology, right? But we, we also need to drive partnerships in Africa that are less technology driven, but with intermediaries such as microfinance institutions or distributors. No? These can be winning strategies as well to further the outreach of products. And at the end, right, we, we need to solve for the last mile question, right, uh, of, of distribution in Africa and the financing hurdles in all of these markets. Great. Thank you so much. Um, our time is up, but uh, thank you to our great panelists. And, uh, and clearly, a lot more needs to be done, but there are certainly opportunities starting to emerge. Thank you so much. What a wonderful panel. Like I said when I was introducing you, it's been really interesting. You've pointed to the technology, but also the funding opportunities. So we're really happy to have had you. We're now headed for a good long break. And when you come back, we'll discuss the power of facts. So please be back at one o'clock Central European time.
Hi, everybody. In this last session of the 2022 NORAD conference, we will take on the world's largest and most ambitious agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals. Once again, NORAD's Director General will be back with an introduction, let me put it this way, from the dungeons of Omicron. His message today is that no matter the challenge, solutions must be knowledge-based. Facts, truth, both at the heart of NORAD's strategy. And looking back in history, it is this mindset that has led to many human advancements. <clears throat> On the corner of Broadway Street and Poland Street in Soho, London, uh, there's a small landmark. A water pump without a handle. That, a strange landmark, I think, but it tells a story. Right down the street from the pump, there's a pub called Jon Snow. And I must add, this is not the Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. It's nothing to do with Game of Thrones. This guy is an actual real-life hero. Just wait. But what is the connection between this pub and the water pump? Well, in 1849, there was a cholera outbreak in the neighborhood. It was dramatic. Each outbreak took many lives. Uh, it was a common cause of death. A doctor that the real Jon Snow was convinced that the sickness spread because of contaminated drinking water. He was laughed at, uh, and his theories was met with forceful resistance. Because as everyone knew, it was the foul smell in the air that caused cholera, not water. But Snow was a persistent man. Five years later, in 1854, there was a new outbreak of cholera in London. Jon Snow started working. He interviewed a lot of those infected and found that they were all connected to a specific water pump. Hesitantly, the local go government finally removed the handle of the pump so it could no longer be used. The outbreak stopped. Jon Snow was right. The disease spread through water, not smell. And this small pump, or, or rather the removal of it, changed the way infectious diseases were managed. It became a game changer. The next part of the NORAD conference is about how we use knowledge to inform development efforts. There's a phrase that some Norwegian viewers will have heard me use a number of times. Fakta har makta. And, and it also rhymes in Norwegian. It means like Nora, Norad formulated in our strategy, that facts inform policy. Our rationale is this. Development aid is a very limited resource. Total global ODA is less than the Norwegian annual national budget. But these limited resources do the most important job in the world, to abolish poverty, cut emissions and reduce inequality. And we spend the money in some of the world's most complex contexts. So quite simply, we do not have the luxury not to work fact-informed. I'm a great fan of the work of uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo. They've been pivotal in using evidence and scientific methods to measure results in development economics. For instance, they and others showed through systematic research and randomized control tests that direct transfers of capital can break the vicious cycle of poverty. Because often poor people are poor simply because they were born poor. To study the effects of our grants in a more systematic way, NORAD is these days looking into a more formalized cooperation with JPAL. JPAL is a research center specialized in studying impacts of social programs and direct is directed by Esther De Flo, who you also will be hearing more from today. We will also be hearing from Ola Rosling, co-author of Factfulness, on the importance of getting the facts right and, and why we also too seldom do. So we need the facts, but the facts are not enough. We also need to let facts inform policy. For that, we need, amongst others, a vibrant public debate. And we don't have enough of that, rather the opposite. Norwegian development aid is approximately 5 billion US dollars. And I can't think of any 5 billion US dollars spent by the Norwegian government that are less debated in this country. But that's actually why we're here also today. This conference with 
1,700 reg registered attendees is one of many efforts by Nora to create platforms for discussion and platforms to let facts inform policy. Yes, indeed. Let facts inform policy and let policy inform action. Esther Duflo is our next guest, and she's from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, co-founder and co-director of JPAL, the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, and herself, Professor of Poverty Alleviation and Development Economics. Her topic today is Effective and Equitable Climate Action, under the title Good Economics for Warmer Times. Welcome to the conference, Professor. Welcome. Today I'm going to talk about a good economics for warmer times, evidence for effective and equitable climate action. My name is Esther Duflo and I'm the professor of economics and uh, one of the founder and directors of the Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT. In the summer of 2020, we could have thought that there would be a new urgency on climate change as the sky of San Francisco was becoming bright orange uh, as people uh, understood the, the scope of potential catastrophes in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. There was uh, um, a silver lining that perhaps this, was, this would awaken uh, a conscience that doing something for climate change was urgent. And yet by the time of the Glasgow conference, it was pretty clear that this urgency seemed to have uh, largely disappeared. So why is that? Well, the problem is that the discussion of climate change is a very difficult discussion for three reasons. The first one is that most of the responsibility of climate change comes from developed countries. The second problem is that they are not the ones who are going to suffer for climate change the most. And the third is that when faced with a crisis, they will uh, act on their citizens first. And that all makes it very difficult uh, for them to come together uh, to deal with this problem, which is never considered to be urgent enough uh, to really systematically change policy and, uh, and activities at the international levels. So let me elaborate on these three points a little bit. The first one is that the emissions responsible for climate change are mainly due to the behavior of rich country citizens. We of course know that historically that it is because uh, of the way that today's rich countries have become rich that there is a stock of CO2 in the atmosphere that is threatening the planet today. But even today, um, the people are, are, are saying, well, you know, China is responsible for a lot of the emissions. India is responsible for the emissions. That's correct. But China and India are warehouses for the world. And the reason why they emit so much is because they produce a lot. And if instead of looking at emission from uh, the places where things are produced and we are looking at emissions that are used to uh, create the goods that people are consuming, we have something called the 1050 rules, which is 10% of the highest polluters are responsible for about 50% of global emissions and the 50% lower emitter are responsible for 10% of global emission. The second problem is that uh, the cost of climate change will be felt in the poorer part of the world. Why is that? Well, because poor countries tend to be in warmer places, and therefore, as the planet warms, all of the climate models are predicting that the increase in very hot days, uh, that is days above 32 uh, centigrade, will be mainly in the poorer countries, as you can see from this map in, the, in South America and in, in Africa. Uh, and even more so by 2050, where you see, for example, this, the Sahel regions becoming incredibly hot. The second issue is that uh, because there is less possibility to adapt uh, in, um, in poorer countries, a given hot day is more likely to lead to death in India than it is in the US, for example. So the increase in the number of deaths is several fold in India when the day is, above, is about uh, 32 degrees. And we see uh, much smaller changes in the US, mainly due to the, the availability, widespread availability of air conditioning. 
all these two things combined means that the mor mortality cost in the next 20 years will be mainly experienced in, in countries that are poor today. In fact, there will be mortality uh, gain uh, in Sweden, Norway, for example. And even more so by 2050, where you're seeing the Baltic countries benefiting by avoiding very cold spell and the, 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 the north of Africa and the Sahel really suffering. Now, all that would be uh, uh, bad enough, uh, but not as bad if it was possible to uh, uh, mount uh, um, re an effective response, perhaps due to a, a sense of collective responsibility for our shared planet. Uh, but what we've seen is during the COVID-19 crisis is that rich countries always put the citizen first uh, when confronted with a crisis, even in ir ir irrational ways. So let's look at the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, the, the, the reaction from the Western world was really underwhelming. Uh, on the one hand, as you can see on the left uh, graph, they uh, spent trillions on their own economies, but didn't uh, mobilize the funds that would have been needed to spend money on the poorer countries. As a result, uh, uh, the, the fiscal response help, des designed to help pe people to cope with the crisis was much more effective and present in the rich countries than in the poor countries. Second, of course, as everybody here knows by now, uh, the world was really incapable of getting uh, poor countries, in particular in Africa, uh, vaccinated against COVID-19 crisis. Even as, as of today, you can see that uh, the, the, the African continent has much less of the uh, vaccine supplies or secured vaccine than the rest of the world. And then when, when I'm saying this is irrational, this of course is irrational because the more unvaccinated people are in the world, the more there are opportunities for the vaccine to change and therefore to come back and infect the rich countries. So if the rich countries are not able to come together to uh, help our planet when it is in their immediate self-interest, then it, there is a big risk that there won't be when there won't be this immediate self-interest, like in the case of the climate, unfortunately. So we really need to consciously break the malediction of inaction, and we need to do it now, uh, before it is too late. What does this mean? Number one, uh, uh, the world must meet climate finance commitment to the low and middle income countries. They are, they are, they, 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 such commitments uh, do exist. Uh, funds are needed for adaptation and mitigation. Uh, yet the, the promises made in, in, at the COP uh, in, in Copenhagen of 100 billion US dollar annually were certainly not meant and not really formally renewed in Glasgow so far. Second is, in order to fight climate change, we need to develop ingenuity. Of course, there is technological ingenuity that is going to be essential, uh, and there is a large reliance on technological solutions in climate discussions. However, technologies alone, technology alone is not going to be sufficient. Often, the purely technological solutions is disappointing in real life, as shown in randomized controlled trials of home weatherizations in the US or energy consulting in India that were conducted by uh, GPL affiliates. On the other hand, the good news is that behavior and policy change are important and they are also possible. For example, in Gujarat, uh, uh, we found with other researchers that better regulatory enforcement reduced industrial pollution when, um, and uh, uh, work showed that payment for ecosystem services reduced deforestation in Uganda, which is a possibility uh, and a template for future works along this line. The third point is we, very much like we cannot rely on technology alone, we cannot rely on ESG funds alone. Uh, at the Glasgow conference, much hope was put on climate finance. Climate finance is great, but there is absolutely no guarantee that climate finance investment will lead to real reduction in emissions. Uh, ultimately, the monitoring of, of, of the impact is funds used for carbon offsets, which are um, often uh, financed by ESG funds, is, is poor. And in particular, it often goes to solutions that are um, uh, technological solutions whose impact in real life has not been proven. And as we just saw, when these solutions are de deployed in real life and evaluated, the results are often disappointing. So in order to maximize the impact of these ESG funds, we need to know much more about what works and what doesn't work uh, to reduce uh, emission or or to uh, offset them in some way or the other. And we also need to rely on policy as well. 
The last point is we can't, we can't tackle climate change without tackling inequality within and across countries. And the reason is that if uh, people, in particular poor people in rich countries, perceive uh, climate change to be a concern of the rich people, which is to be paid for by taxes imposed on the on the on the poor people, then they are not going to want to vote for this and they are not going to support these efforts uh, with two consequences. One is the, that the, effort, the, the efforts are going to stall and the second is that it could lead to uh, the rise of, of populism that, and a backlash against uh, a both a social and environmental efforts. And this is uh, an example of a slogan that was uh, uh, deployed against uh, carbon taxation in France. And the The problem was that carbon taxation came on the heel of a decrease in wealth tax, or in fact an elim elimination of wealth tax. So this was seen as something which was uh, anti-poor. The upshot of all of this is that there are many things we don't yet know. There are many things we don't yet know about how to change behavior, how to do this in a way that is equitable both around the world and within countries. And therefore, development organizations uh, such as NORAD can and should generate and use evidence to reduce poverty and emission more effectively. How can they do that? Uh, first of all, invest in randomized evaluations as a tool for innovation and learning. There are many candidate solutions. You can try them out, create a library that both private and public actors can uh, rely on uh, to inform their decision making and their choice in what to invest. Uh, leverage data for climate action, reduce barrier to access and incorporate insights into decision making. And um, have uh, launch evidence to policy units, evidence labs, uh, such as, for example, the uh, uh, Fund for Innovation and Development at, at the Agence Française Development, uh, which both will invest, is investing in a climate and development solution uh, with an effort to evaluate them and scale up what works. And finally, uh, you know, uh, not um, over and above this uh, innovation funds, mainstream evolution in the project cycle through earmarking for funding, personal and partnership for evaluations at the design scale. It is only by learning more uh, that and, and generating evidence at an accelerated pa path that we will be able to generate the type of positive dynamics that can break the malediction of inaction. Thank you so much. And thank, and thank you, Professor Duflo of MIT. Now, we're honored to announce the attendance of Bill Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In his talk on leadership in global health and development, Mr. Gates will be looking at the critical year ahead. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you. Thank you to NORAD for extending the invitation. And thanks to all my fellow speakers for drawing attention to the sustainable development goals, which are now due in only eight years. I particularly want to commend the government of Norway for its impressive global leadership, both before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. From your generous foreign assistance every year To your support for a wide range of critical health and development issues, Norway is a model for the world to aspire to. Your backing of some of the most effective institutions in global health has been essential to the progress we've made over the past 20 years. Norway is an original Gavi donor. It's also one of the founders of CEPI, as well as its host. And our foundation has been honored to work alongside you to accelerate vaccine R&D around the world, especially during the pandemic. Norway has also been a key donor to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, and the most generous supporter of the fund on a per capita basis. Your additional contributions to the COVID-19 response mechanism have been critical to ensuring we don't lose ground on existing epidemics while fighting this pandemic. We hope you will continue your strong record of support during the fund's replenishment this year. With only eight years until the SDGs are due, we need 2022 
to be a year of action. It's going to take everyone, governments, philanthropies, nonprofits, and the private sector, committed, focused, and working together to meet our collective goals by 2030. That's especially true given that COVID-19 has set back progress on many fronts. The pandemic reminds us how essential health is to all of the sustainable development goals, including eliminating poverty. We've seen how waves of infections have forced lockdowns, damaged economies, and plunged millions back into poverty. These effects have been experienced disproportionately by vulnerable populations, and we've widened the gaps in gender inequality. The inequity has been compounded by the fact that despite having great vaccines, far too few of the people at high risk in low-income countries have gotten their first shot. Our unequal distribution and funding for infrastructures reinforced that difference. To reach the SDGs by 2030, including ending poverty, the world must be much better prepared for the next pandemic. We can't afford to get caught flat-footed again or to have another inequitable response. This means building a system for accelerating the global supply of vaccines, one that can make more doses and allocate them more equitably. We also need better tools to contain the outbreaks when they come along. We need more readily available rapid testing, uh, more genetic sequencing, C variants, and more disease surveillance uh, that will catch the pandemic in the early stage. The good news is that by investing in these public health tools now, we can minimize the likelihood of another COVID-19. And these investments will bring benefits during non-pandemic years. These systems during peacetime can track and fight the other infectious diseases that remain a huge burden in low-income countries. Of course, even as we work to end this pandemic and prepare for the next, we need to focus on another crisis, climate change. This year and every year going forward will be critical to that fight. As I said in my recent climate book, we need to invest now in game-changing innovations that can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and give everyone access to clean, affordable, and reliable energy. We also need to support adaptation, helping people deal with the negative effects of climate change that are already here. By giving them better seeds and other tools, we can minimize those impacts. Reaching zero emissions by 2050 will be one of the toughest tasks humans have ever accomplished. But I remain optimistic we can get it done. At COP26 in Glasgow, I saw a great deal of enthusiasm and intense engagement behind green innovation. And I think the world is waking up to the fact that we need bold collaborative action right now to reach those goals. Here again, Norway has been a strong leader. Your pledge to double climate financing and triple support for adaptation efforts by 2026 will hopefully inspire other nations to step up. The more boldly we act now, the more likely we are to succeed in the long run. If we work together and build the innovations and systems we need for the future, I believe we can both avoid future pandemics curb climate change, and also achieve the SDGs to create a better, fairer, and healthier world. It won't be easy, but nothing worth accomplishing ever is. And I'm very glad that all of you here are part of this collective effort. Thank you. Big thank you to Bill Gates for attending this year's NORAD conference, and not least for his call of action that goes out to all of us. Now, our next speaker is an avid defender of fact-based information. In 2014, he coined the term factfulness and later co-wrote the Factfulness book, which was launched in 2018. 
Ula Rosling is president and co-founder of Gapminder Foundation, which he founded together with his wife Anna and his father Hans. Now, Gapminder believes in making education about the SDDs S sustainable development goals, less ideological and more fact-based. Thank you for joining us, Ola Rosling. Thank you very much. So uh, that was a great introduction. Yes, the anti-ideological uh, profile is really what I want to emphasize here. And I uh, can show that um, the, the, the knowledge that we're conveying and the facts we're working with are pretty neutral. Uh, I do that by testing people's knowledge. And I sent out a um, test to many of the participants. And uh, today now here, I'm going to show the results of how people answered. Those were nine ABC questions. And this was the first one. We're going to look at your results and compare it with the data. Uh, let's start with this one. 30 years ago, 56% of the world's population lived in so-called low-income countries. What is to share today? Is it A, B, or C, 9%, 35%, or 60%? Let's look at this uh, starting in a very, very long perspective. Let's go back to year 1800 and look at two indicators, because I also asked a question about life expectancy. This is uh, the World Health Chart, one of our free teaching materials that is used across the world in classrooms to show a fact-based worldview. It's like a world map. You can see all the countries back in 1800, uh, far before development really took off. Uh, it, back then, most countries had a life expectancy below 40 and very low incomes. Norway is uh, quite high there. You're gonna, it, it's the small bubble at the very top, actually. And um, no, the, yeah, uh, you, you will see it soon bumping up. No, it's on top of Germany there in 1800. But uh, the important thing with this world map is that it changes. Let's play the first 100 years in just 10 seconds. Sorry, like this. Um, there we go. So during 1800 until 1900, the world changed. You can see Norway and Sweden and Iceland leading the world there to the right and Denmark being having longer lives than anyone else. That was the Spanish flu. And here we are now in a world in 1960. After the World War, the world looked like this. And this is one of the fact questions I asked you about life expectancy. Back then, 55% of humanity lived in countries where life expectancy was below 50. What is the share today? That was one of the questions. And let's play forward now and see how the world continued changing uh, during the next uh, 30 years or so until uh, uh, year 1990, okay? You can see already by 1990, slightly before the HIV pandemic, uh, most countries had reached above 50 in life expectancy already back then. And here's the second question I asked, how many countries today are in low income? Uh, definition by the World Bank it was. I didn't mention that in the question, but I'll get back to that. In 1990, that's not so long time ago, right? 58% uh, of humanity, the vast majority lived in a country classified as low income. How many are there today in such countries? Okay, we play forward and you can see how majority of the countries who used to be low income have now reached a middle income level. And if the world continues with this GDP per capita uh, growth roughly after the pandemic, we're going to have a world where almost no country are on the uh, level where the low income was defined. Uh, and this change, which I just show you, where there are no countries left below life expectancy 50 and there are hardly any countries left, 9% of humanity, in so-called low-income countries, compared to what people answered. Okay, so here are the results when I ask this question. Correct answer now we know is 9%, of course. And actually, together with Ipsos two years ago, we asked this in 32 countries. And here are the results. On average, 7.2% of people picked 
the right answer. In Saudi Arabia, more than elsewhere, but of course the uncertainty of these kind of polls are not perfect. Consistently though, across all the countries we tested, people, when they hear low-income countries, they assume it's a lot of people. Very few pick this option. On an ABC question like this, it's actually quite easy to pick the right answer compared to the results. If you ask a monkey uh, an ABC question, they have a 33% chance of picking the right answer. Monkeys would score better than humans in all the countries where we have tested. Okay, so, so wait. This means that humans are not just randomly guessing, right? They are not just picking A, B, or C like the monkeys do, because if you do that, you're going to score 33%. To score less than random requires misconceptions. And these are the kind of systematic misconceptions that, that we measure. When we say low-income countries, people think of something like developing countries, which is completely not defined. And then they assume a majority of mankind live in these kind of countries. In their minds, people don't have multiple categories. They think about poor countries and rich countries. When someone say poor countries, do they mean Poland, Brazil, Tunisia, Philippines, or Malawi? In Malawi, there are still lots of kids who don't go to school, where in Poland, every child go to school. It's an enormous difference of what we mean when we say poor and poverty. And that's why I asked about low-income countries. Let's just look at the results. Here are your results. 360 people of you answered. Of course, the most knowledgeable and busy, they didn't have time to answer. So, But those who who answered scored unfortunately worse than Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. 14% managed to pick the right answer. Congratulations, you're pretty knowledgeable. Uh, actually, you shouldn't compare yourself with monkeys. I know you don't like that. You actually like to rather compare yourself with Swedes, like me, I'm from Sweden. 7% of the Swedes picked the right answer. So in this sense, Norway, at least this audience here today, is twice as knowledgeable about the low-income miracle that has happened because these people moved to middle-income countries. And 14% uh, of you picked that right answer. Here are the number of people who picked the wrong answer in all the countries in your audience. Look at your results. 59% of you. Imagine that the number of people in so-called low-income countries increased you know that the population in the world increased. And when someone say low income, you think that's all the other countries, pretty much the non-Western countries or something, and you know population increased that. And you completely miss that 75% of humanity live in middle income countries, ranging to uh, uh, down in Bangladesh, for example, all the way up to uh, Brazil. And then a country like Chile is actually a high income country but most people don't get that. We fail to realize when the world is changing and when the world goes through what Norway, it took 100 years for Norway to go through that change and the world does it in 40 years, we completely miss it. We don't realize why industries are, are now escaping Europe and, and uh, flourishing in the rest of the world. So that was one question. I asked you nine questions, okay? This was the one at the very bottom. And I'm, I'm gonna focus, of course, on, on those where you scored bad. There were four of them where you scored better than chimpanzees. So I'm gonna skip them completely, even though, of course, it's not really a good thing that almost half of you believe uh, that many countries have short lives and, and you think extreme poverty in rich countries is quite high, etc. cetera. Uh, but let's forget about that and instead focus on the things you don't know, because that's what our foundation do. We don't, we don't really work with education. We try to get rid of misconceptions. So where you score worse than random, there is a job for us to do, right? Uh, the many yearbooks that come out and the climate reports, most of us, we hear about them. Maybe we print them out and put them under our, our arm like this and pretend that we read the book. But most of us don't really consume facts, even though we live in the first time uh, ever when there are lots of facts about pretty much everything. So this is the, the, the question. How are we going to make sure that we actually know the facts about the present when we try to forecast the future? Because those people in the middle income countries moving up the income scale, they are going to consume more, more than any country or any population has ever done before. The real world market is coming next. What we've seen so far is only the trailer, okay? 
So, but what did you answer wrongly? Well, you had the low income misconception that it increased. Uh, and then also there is another question there where I asked, where are people most, where are people uh, least satisfied with their lives on average? And a majority of you, just like the public when we ask, they think that in high income countries, people are least satisfied. This is a complete misconception. And I know people don't like to think that more money makes you more happy. And of course, there's not such automatic correlation. But if you look at the data, when you ask in every, pretty much every happiness study that has uh, covered all the way from low income to high income, you see a very, very strong pattern. Uh, I want to show this over time because it's such a highly sensitive topic. In our culture in Sweden and Norway, we don't want money to make you happy. We want to re refuse any statement that claim that money makes you happy. But when we do that, we fail to realize why six or seven billion people on earth are struggling to get as rich as we are. Look at Norway to the very far right. You're not the happiest in the world. That's Denmark. But you see this strong correlation. At the same time, there is a huge difference on the same income scale, as you can see. This was in 2006, and since then the UN has been collecting with Gallup quite good data. It's not perfect at all. Look at the pattern. When countries get richer, I'm going to play this forward up till a few years ago, uh, and you can see now that as the countries get richer, actually many of them fall down. So there is not a clear automatic correlation. Look now, when they move forward, many of them are moving up and down, and India is definitely moving down as, on average, it is getting richer. Many people in India are not experienced a richer life. They didn't share this income with everybody in the population. So, of course, they, I'm not claiming that there is a simple correlation between money and happiness. But there's a good reason for people trying to get richer. Within these countries, the people with higher incomes are often happier. And in general, people strive to get more money, which means there will be more overconsumption, whether you like it or not. And that brings us over to the next topic about climate change. Let me show you this now instead of aggregated country averages. Here is a way to look at the data of number of people on different income levels, dollars per day. Uh, I play it from 1800 just to get the big picture. Back then, most countries in the world were low income countries if the definition had existed. Norway, Sweden were low income countries all the time up in, uh, to the uh, First World War, Second World War, a majority was low income countries. Then middle income countries, orange and green here, start to evolve. And not until the 70s, there were a portion of countries, this is when I was born, 75, there were two humps in the world. There were the rich and the poor, right? And instead of country average, we must see that within every country there is a huge difference. You can see in 2006 that the hump, almost the two humps have disappeared roughly, right? You can see the big hump in the middle now moving out of extreme poverty. And in 2022, we don't have a divided world. We don't have the poor and the rich. The 7 billion people are there in the middle. In extreme poverty, people are still lacking uh, antibiotics and vaccines because they live in the poor tail in middle income countries or in the low income countries in the lower majority of the population here to the left, you see. But while we're looking at the left, you can see this part of the screen here where where people have a, an, a, a very low income. Uh, that is the concern of bringing people out of extreme poverty, where fertility rates are huge, populations are still increasing. That's one side of the world. There they need economic growth. Up on the other end of the world, level four, we call it here, high income countries, we can see, I'm going to play this forward with a rough forecast I made with IMF GDP per capita growth to try to predict how many people are going to come up to this level of high income where we are, which means more CO2 emissions during the next couple of years. Just play it quickly forward. And you can see that uh, now in, in, uh, during the next couple of, of years, if I change, I'll try to change the color here to regions instead. You can see that in this part of the world, oh, my computer is locked. Let's skip that. And you can do that on the website. Uh, basically, 
the amount, amount of high and high income consumers is going to increase in all these middle income countries. And that's really what puts a pressure on the climate and, and the common resources that we share on the planet. And our ability, if we can integrate Europe into that big hump of middle income countries so that we can collaborate and participate in that global uh, development of, of the rich who are getting richer, right? I'm, I'm afraid that Europeans in general fail to realize the enormous increase of incomes and capacities and education of that big hump of five billions. We continue living in the past where we were ahead of the pack, as you saw in the first graph, but we are no longer. And very soon, we don't have a chance to mandate exactly the rules for everything. We need to start educating our kids about a more humble kind of European. Yeah, you've met Swedes, you know, there is a superiority that used to be before, but now Norway is richer than us. But most people in Sweden still kind of think of Norway as the little brother. We need to redefine our perception of each other when the reality changes. And that is a challenge on the global level. So now I want to end with two questions about climate change, climate action. Uh, this first one is crucial. During the past 40 years, the amount of oil and natural gas in known research, what happened? Did it double? Did it stay the same or did it drop to half? Most people believe, as you can see in this uh, survey, we did a small survey in the UK and in Sweden, and almost everyone, of course, intuitively say, as we have consumed more oil and gas, uh, there must be less of it left in the ground, right? It sounds intuitive, but our exploration of new research have increased more than the consumption. And this is the data from uh, British Petroleum official data. Fossil fuel research at the top, we have oil 2.5 times the amount we had in 1980. Known research, of course, a different quality of oil, etc. But the gas as well, 2.8 times what we knew in 1980. When people don't know this, they don't realize the challenge of climate action. The fact that they believe the reserves are declining, so they are probably waiting for an automatic price increase. When we run out of a resource, the price goes up and we will naturally switch to something else. That will not happen. The challenge really is, and I tested climate activists on this one, and pretty much everyone are wrong about it. The challenge is we need to stop using the fossil fuels before we run out of it. That's a completely different challenge, okay? Here is the last question. And this one, I'd, I'd say pretty much everyone is wrong about. What happens to the CO2 level in the atmosphere if we have the annual emissions today, okay? There's, there's CO2 up there and we have our annual emissions. What happens? It increases up there or it stays roughly the same or it decreases? Most people intuitively say, if we have the emissions, it must decrease. It's wrong. If we have the emissions, it keep increasing. How can that be? It's pretty simple and it's very crucial. I say this is the most severe misunderstanding about climate action I know about. Uh, please help spread this. Our material is free. I want to explain this to everybody. Every school kid should learn this in school instead of sitting and crying and just being aware. They need to understand how the climate works. Here is an example. If this is the emissions we have, humanity as total, in 2021 and next year we emit the same amount and then next year the same amount again, right? Okay, everybody understands it keeps accumulating. Now I'm going to have our emission. In 2025, imagine we managed to have it. It keeps adding. You see, year by year, the cloud I'm sending up there is half as big as the previous year and than it is now. But it just keeps adding, you see, at a slightly slower rate, but it adds up. There. It's like a bathtub. If you keep pouring in water, it will increase even though you pour in a little bit less. It's not until we reach zero that it stops increasing in the atmosphere. And most of you answered this question wrongly. How could you not know this? Haven't you talked about the climate pretty much every week during the last uh, five years? In Södermalm, in Stockholm, where I live, everybody talk about the climate, but they don't sit down and learn stuff. So what we're doing now, we're creating a free teaching material about climate facts. And when 95% of people are wrong about something, it means both the right politics and the left politics are equally wrong. So it's neutral. And these are the kind of facts we're finding, like the low income question. It's where everyone are systematically wrong in the same direction. 
It means we can have a third position and common ground and realize we're wrong about stuff. And this has implications because the moment we reach zero net emission, look now what happens during the next 100 years, how much of that emission, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere will remain 100 years later? That was the last question I asked you. We move forward. This is a rough model only, right? The amount of carbon dioxide that naturally disappears from the atmosphere is extremely low. You can hardly see it. OK, 100 years from now, roughly 95 percent of whatever we put up there is still going to be up there 100 years from now. We'll leave it not just for the next generation and their grandchildren, but it's going to stay for a very, very long time. Because the tree, even if the trees capture carbon, as we learn in the photosynthesis, it's a very slow process. And then the trees actually let the carbon back again when when they uh, fall into the earth, etc. It's a very small loop and not much is captured. It's really when it turns into fossil, that's when the carbon disappears. The 5% that will disappear over 100 years goes into the oceans, most of it. These facts we need to understand. Otherwise, climate action becomes an ideological, emotional debate. We need real infrastructure changes to have a real energy transformation. And that needs to happen at the right end of the income scale, while the people at the poorest end, those in extreme poverty, are able to have economic growth with whatever means it takes. I'm ready to say, yes, they have to burn fossil fuels to get out of extreme poverty, because extreme poverty is hell. OK, and the reason we want to stop climate change is to avoid human suffering in the future, 100 years from now. But there is human suffering already going on. We need to keep two thoughts in our head at the same time. We need to help people escape extreme poverty by building whatever infrastructure and resources they need to escape. Right. That is one thing that's at the low income end. The high income command, we need to change our lifestyle because we are the people who emit the emissions. We shouldn't confuse our emission with the, with the people in extreme poverty. And this, is, I think, is a major challenge when it comes to, to the aid community in the future. To keep your head apart and say, OK, what applies to Swedish lifestyles must not apply everywhere else. You need to look at the data and compare the proportions. And this I don't see in how we're debating the global climate and the kind of pressure we try to push on everyone else, even though the high income uh, consumers are the emitters and the people who really exploit uh, natural resources. Uh, so I'm trying to compile all these facts and make it possible for organizations, governmental agencies. And now I hope really by participating here today, I would like to see Norway to be the first fact based country in the world, because I've been trying to push Sweden for a long time, SIDA and UDA, uh, etc., to be the first ones. Some people there are really positive, but really to sit down and learn a lot of facts. It takes a lot of time. You know, when you got the driving license, you had to learn all the theory and all the rules for the traffic. And no one does it for free. I think organizations today in a changing world need to require learning from their employees to make sure that we can rely on collective wisdom when we try to forecast the future. Today, we're very far from that. And that's what we're trying to show with Gapminder. The misconceptions out there in the public also exist in this eminent audience who is watching this presentation here today. So please be humble and curious about the world. You pretty wrong about a lot of things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ola, for your myth busting. It was very energetic, informative and fun. So um, we've talked about the pandemic uh, several times during the conference uh, because it has demonstrated uh, a setback for many development efforts. Based on that, the last panel today will be discussing the pandemic as a driver of inequality. Now, we have the following participants in the panel. Director General of NORAD Board Vega Suliel might be down with Omicron, but he will surely be alive and kicking in the panel. Joining him, will be Dr. Ayoade Alakija, co-chair of the Africa Vaccine Delivery Alliance. She has served as chief humanitarian coordinator of Nigeria and is newly appointed special envoy to the World Health Organization Act Accelerator. 
In the panel, we also have administrator of UNDP, Achim Steiner. He has for decades been a global leader on sustainable development, climate resilience and international cooperation not least as former leader of the UN Environment Programme. And we have to welcome back senior advisor Nikolai Hegertun, who was here previously moderating a panel. He's also back. Enjoy the talk. Thank you, Asta. Uh, the title of this last section is The Pandemic as a Driver of Inequality. Um, and as mentioned, um, the pandemic has really exposed disparities between the haves and have-nots in this world. And this inequality, both within countries, but also between countries, uh, is now plain to see for anyone. Um, but the questions uh, that we like to address now is what can development assistance or development cooperation do about this? Uh, and I want to start with you, Dr. Alaki Jam. Um, historically, we've uh, conceptualized inequality by looking at income distributions, um, but at the moment it seems that um, inequality is just as relevant for, for us to understand the, 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 the ongoing efforts to deal with the pandemic, for example, or even the climate crisis. Uh, we've heard today that 10% of, of global emitters, that's just 770 million people, are responsible for 48% for of global CO2 emissions uh, and, and the bottom half, that's uh, 3.8 billion people, are responsible for around 12% of global emissions. So how should uh, the development community um, relate to and apply these new insights and this, this broader understanding of inequality? Um, well, thank you very much, and it is very good to, to join you all. I'm very happy to see my friends, um, Bod, happy to see you up and up and about and hope you're feeling okay, and also Akeem, wonderful, wonderful to be together with you again. Look, I think you actually have said it all in your, in your opening statement when you talked about climate. I say often that COVID and climate are two sides of the same coin, um, really like COVID, like climate, as it goes for COVID, so it's going to go for climate. And those figures you gave were actually perfect. It was really quite stark. You know, you talked about about three point something billion people only responsible for 3% of the emissions. And we also have exactly at this moment about the same exact number of people, about three point something billion people also having no vaccines, whilst the others who are also re responsible for all the emissions have all the vaccines. So when climate change is being discussed and when we're but also funding for, 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 for climate, it is also, again, going to be turned on its head. We are seeing the same issue go round and round. And the global pandemic has really revealed the international linkages between nations and societies. And the numbers of, of, of cases and the, the, even the way we measure cases the metric by which we measure severity, you know, people are saying that Africa is not badly affected because Africa doesn't have ICUs overrun, Africa doesn't have hospitals overrun, etc. But there are no ICUs. There are very few hospital beds. So we cannot use the same metric. That in itself is an equality, the metric by which we measure the severity of the disease. And so we are also immediately disadvantaged because we are already disadvantaged. So the world says, well, we're not seeing your hospitals and your ICUs for, which don't exist. Therefore, you don't have a problem. Look, it, 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 the, the, the pandemic has really shown the fault lines. You know, you said the haves and the have-nots, and that is the best way to put it. We are seeing an expansion in the inequity. You know, it's not just inequality. There's a huge difference between inequality and inequity. They're interrelated, but they're different. And we are seeing a, a fracturing of this world uh, along those lines. You know, we in the pre-talk, myself and, and um, Akeem were talking about the beginnings of this year, which are really quite shaky. You know, they're shaking one but as you, you hear, you know, of the, 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 the talks of what's going on in, in Eastern Europe. You, you hear, you know, of, of coups in Western Africa and you, you also hear the rise of Omicron. And, you know, Omicron, by the way, also now has a sub variant. As I say, it has now has children and grandchildren. So we don't know that this thing is over. And it most certainly it's not over for most of us. So the, but it, the, all those situations we're talking about, they're caused by a feeling of inequality. They're caused by a feeling of a lack of inclusion. And so inequality is much wider than just income distribution. And as we're 
you know, earlier was talking about income distribution and high income countries and more people are now in a lower middle income countries. I would disagree with some of that analysis is that more countries might have moved, but the sheer numbers of people have not really moved in, 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 in any way, shape or form. That's my initial response. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Steiner, you worked extensively with, uh, with both global challenges such as the environment and the climate, but, but also very much with country-specific development. And uh, how would you like to address this, this broad spectrum of inequality that we're seeing now? Thank you, Nicola, and uh, good to join you, and but um, good to see you, and, and despite um, you know COVID, good to have you with us, and thank you also for the invitation to join us. And I think um, uh, Dr. Alakija just laid out the spectrum already, and I think we're, from where we look at inequality today, and you know, UNDP in 2019, with the Human Development Report, took this issue actually very much to the core of our whole development discourse. It was that report on beyond income, beyond averages, beyond today. And I think what, what is um, stark in, in understanding not only inequality in its phenomenology, which we can measure in different ways, I think increasingly what we are seeing also is that inequality has an extraordinary corrosive force in our societies. Because um, whether you look at it globally, uh, the numbers are well known. We live in an extremely unequal world and it's just gotten a lot more unequal as the pandemic progressed. And the same is actually true within countries. So for much of UNDP's daily work, it is to help governments appreciate, first of all, who are those who have been left behind? Secondly, how are you able to assist them to not be structurally trapped in this poverty that they find themselves in? And I think in our development arena, we need to understand also that inequality very quickly uh, translates into something that has to do with a sense of justice or injustice and also insecurity. So much of what we're witnessing today in our evening news around the world when people go onto the streets, start protesting, when we see coup d'etats, when we see implosions of, of state institutions and, and even social contracts across many countries, and notably not only in poor countries, but also in developed and middle-income countries, because inequality is that corrosive force that begins to tear at the fabric of a society. So much of what we have to focus on is, first of all, to um, understand who are the people and why are they continuously stuck in, in this cycle of poverty. And sometimes even people who escape extreme poverty, this is one of the most disconcerting figures, 40% of them fall back into extreme poverty. Why? For instance, because there is no healthcare system that provides a basic health insurance. So for many people, when their father, their mother, their son, their daughter falls ill, all the savings are essentially deployed in order to rescue that individual. And so the whole family falls back into extreme poverty. It's just one more aspect that the pandemic has in many ways amplified, but also put a spotlight on. And I think in the way that we move forward is that we have to recognize that poverty is not the price of development. You know, there was a kind of chronology of first of all, you you know you industrialize, you urbanize. Yes, inequality is a price that comes with it, and later you correct for that. Look at our world today. Look at how many parts of the world societies are falling apart. That kind of chronology of trickle-down development, which it was called in the 70s and 80s, still persists in some ways in, in the way we approach the issue today. It simply is no longer tenable, neither at national level nor really as a global family of nations. And that is, I think, the core challenge to all of us who work in development. But let me also emphasize in the political leadership, in the geopolitical perspectives of crisis management, in the security outlook on the world, we live in a profound age of human insecurity. Thank you. Uh, Bordweg, I'm the director of NORAD. I'd like to, uh, to comment on this as well. How, how is this diagnosis that we are hearing here changing your perspective on, on global development and progress? Um, and how is, how is NORAD dealing with this, these questions of inequality? Well, <clears throat> first, uh, thanks to Akim and uh, Jodi for joining us. Great to see you. And, and um, I'm doing fine in isolation here <laughs> back in my home so far. Um, well, uh, I think it's at the core, inequality will be at the core of devel development assistance and international development work in the decades to come, even more so than it used to. Um, of course, if we if you take the long view, we have behind us a generation or so of, of uh, immense social and economic progress, right? And even though it was slowing down a little bit before COVID-19, 
Uh, we've seen uh, uh, extreme poverty falling, growth rates were for many years uh, higher in many developing uh, economies uh, uh, compared to rich uh, countries. But uh, the pandemic ha seems to be increasing inequality to a quite high degree, and we probably don't know the full picture yet. But of course, we see it in e economic inequality. I mean, in many rich countries or many of the biggest companies in the world and the owners of them, they've, they've been doing really well. And in uh, developed economies, rich countries like Norway, uh, we've had the economy to, you know, to keep people employed, to, to use our welfare state. And, and actually to, to, to keep uh, the economy running and, and, and to make sure that our, our businesses uh, 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 don't go bankrupt and so on, which has been important for our countries, but also uh, means that we're doing relatively well. But none of this has been true for, especially for uh, the least developed countries and lower middle income countries. Uh, and we see now like policy director Lars Lu was showing this morning, that growth rates can be back to, to what was expected for many developed economies, while for the least developed countries, they will remain low. But maybe also, Nikolai, we, we are talking about some kind of multidimensional inequality, because I think that also other factors uh, are important. Jordi, of course, mentioned vaccine uh, um, equity or the lack of it. Which is, an un, which is underpinning all this, as long as we don't have more equity in vaccines, this inequality will probably continue to rise. But also look at a, a, an issue like education, or, or I mean, uh, human resources, like Kim talked about. Uh, I just saw, uh, saw uh, Uganda, an important country, partner country for us. Kids have been out of school for almost two years. Imagine what kind of inequality that will create compared to countries in the Nordic region, for instance, was that where we have been doing relatively better uh, in, in terms of education and all the effects it has on gender equality and all these things. So, so I think that this inequality and the consequences of it will be a major issue for anyone working with international development cooperation in the decades to come. Thank you. I, I'd like to ask this, this brilliant panel. Uh, it seems every time something bad happens, whether it's a financial crisis or, or, or increased food prices or a pandemic or, or nature crisis, um, it seems inequality increases as a result of that. Sometimes this is referred to as the Matthew effect. And, and this could, of course, lead us into fatalism that this is just how the world works, right? Uh, but this also fundamentally breaks with uh, what we think the world ought to be. And, and within the development community, I, I think we're constantly adopting visions and agendas and, and goals that revolves around very much the question of what the world ought to be. Uh, just think of the SDGs. Um, but from what we've heard today, uh, it's, it's really hard to reconcile that with uh, <clears throat> what we're currently experiencing. And if, if more crises, um, such as the climate crisis or the nature crisis or even pandemics, if that represents the new normal in a way uh, in the coming years, how can we break out of this tendency of constantly increased inequality and, th and that gulf between <laughs> uh, what we think the world ought to be and what it seems to be? This is sort of the widened gap that also Bill Gates uh, talked about. Mr. Steiner, uh, Esther Duflo also mentioned that global warming will be uh, much, will harm poor countries, much more than rich countries as well. So, so how can we change the way that crisis always seem to at least increase inequality? I think the simplest way to answer this, Nicola, is something that common sense and intuition will essentially answer itself to every citizen. And it's, it's together. And this is the fascinating moment in time that we live in. I mean, people are in some ways experiencing the opposite of, of, of solidarity, of, of coming together. Many are you know, often talking about the crisis of multilateralism. But you know, the harsh truth is what we are struggling with is, can we live up to the, essentially the needs of our time? In, in UNDP, we have embraced that narrative of living in the age of the Anthropocene, where the collective impact of humans is now literally shaping the geological, the biophysical realities of this planet. It is a different era in which we live. And I think that notion of responding together can then be broken into many different component parts. For instance, 
in a world that is wealthier than ever in human history in monetary terms, where just four countries, the United States, China, Japan, and Germany, account for half the world's GDP, where the GDP of the United States is the equivalent of that of 170 countries, do we begin to understand that it is actually within, first of all, uh, our reach, but also our responsibility to look at how we collectively invest in one another. The idea that somehow development is getting to a certain per capita GDP and then you're on your own and see if you can sink or swim simply doesn't work in a world of pandemics, of climate change, of very differential responsibilities. And so I think at the core of the way forward is not the absence of answers and ways to do it. We have plenty of them. In fact, you heard Hans just speak to many of the examples of how it can be done, how it has been done. The tragedy of our time is that we are not able to pivot in the way that our institutions, our national institutions, but also globally, are able to articulate a rationale for acting together. Climate change and the notion that the poorest countries who have contributed the least should now borrow money expensively in order to do things quicker that wealthier countries are not willing to do, including those who produce fossil fuels, whose economies have been built around the 20th century economy, have not been able to come up with $100 billion. This is the kind of uh, fatalism that is self-inflicted. It is not inevitable. These are choices we make. And I think our role as development practitioners is not to argue for the next project where we can dig some more wells, maybe deeper wells, because the water tables are dropping, but actually to come to a point where the idea that Africa, for instance, could be the next frontier of an energy revolution, that the wealthier countries have every reason not just to lend money or to provide some philanthropy, but to co-invest significantly in Africa's, first of all, transition towards a continent where the majority of people actually have access to electricity, and secondly, an energy infrastructure that is renewable and low carbon. But what are we doing? We meet year after year, and we cannot even manage to mobilize $100 billion. And the same story translates into the response to the pandemic. And yes, politics is complicated. Our societies are very impatient. But this is an age where wisdom is needed more than ever, because otherwise what we're doing right now is to undermine the very foundations upon which we actually depend to get beyond this point. The fact that we can do this, that it is feasible, is beyond question in my mind. Dr. Alakija, uh, do you agree? Do you, how, how do you see the, the way forward in, in a time of crisis? Look, I think, first of all, let, let, let me let me break this down. I think we refer to both inequality in this. We're, we're mixing the terms. Inequality, which are bal unbalanced conditions, unequal distribution of resource, um, and inequity, which is a state of being unfair and unequal. And there are un un avoidable, avoidable differences arising from poor governance and cultural exclusion. These are some of the things that we're discussing. Equity needs to be achieved before people can achieve equality. And so your question is how. I agree with a lot a lot of what Akeem has said. I mean, I think the current crisis that we're in is an opportunity for the world, for all of us to shift the balance of power, to begin to change the alliances and allegiances that control who has a say, who gets to make decisions, who gets to review and reorder things, who gets an invitation to sit at the table. I did an interview yesterday with Development Today with um, a, a, a journalist who's actually based in, in Norway, I believe. And one of the conversations, the core of our conversation was around the fact that I have recently been invited to sit at the big boys table, so to speak, and that how is that going to change things, for instance, for the ACT Accelerator? I mentioned to Akeem earlier that this is what we need to begin to do more of. We need to have the voices of, of those who are most affected, those who can tell you that inequity and inequality to me mean totally different things. You know, we have a world, let me go to practicalities, you know, we're, we're linking COVID and climate. I really like that. I recently, myself, together with Maduka Pai, wrote an article in Science Magazine in which we did the same thing, like COVID, like climate. You know, we're being asked to pay for something that we haven't caused. My Half of my life is in the Pacific Islands of Fiji. And of course, we've all seen the news this week. My dog who, who is behind me, his name is Tonga. And he reminds me all the time of what has just happened in, in Tonga with the, the, the earthquake and the effects of climate on that part of the world. And yet the whole world is not including their voices to, to a large extent in the, in, at the middle main decision-making table, those very, very resource-challenged islands are being expected to, to, to 
cough up resources to pay for the the, the the inequity and the inequality that the West has caused them. I have seen the effects. I lived through um, Cyclone Winston and saw the effects of, of schools that were flattened, communities that were flattened. But Bart spoke just now about education. And again, I want to speak to education in the context, not of climate this time, but of COVID. Education has, has completely destroyed so many of the gains we've made in gender equality. And as a woman, I would have to really lean in on that. Girls are no longer going to school. Girls are being married off at a really early age. People are being sold into sex slavery <clears throat> because the poverty that has arisen as a result of, of COVID means that girls are being deprioritized in communities and in families. We have to go down to the, pro to the, to, to the basics of this. We can talk at a very high level about multidimensional poverty index and we can indices and we can talk about, you know, what it is that can be done at sort of high level, but we also need a bottom-up approach. We need to go back to the basics of why we became development pr practitioners. You know, there was a lot of participant observation going on back in the day, but now you don't need participant observation. You don't need people to go to inter-communities and do participant observation because we have technology. We need to use that technology to bring in the voices from what we call the global south. That is the only way, that is the how of how we're going to fix the equality going forward. We cannot have a world where we are so separated, where we're so divided, where the decision-making table looks one way and, 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 and the rest of us at the end of the decisions, at the sort of receiving end of the decisions, look another. We cannot have one part of the world deciding who lives and who dies, who is educated and who is not, who, who, who has food on their table and who does not. So the how means inclusion. The how means lifting some up, you know, talent they say is universal opportunity is not creating opportunities so that those of us who have not had a voice at those tables can begin to show those who have had that voice and have the resources how we can work together hand in hand together as one to make this world a more equal place uh, i think this is interesting because domestically when we when we try to deal with for example rising uh, income inequality you tend to tax progressively. You tend to look at the needs of the poor and then you look at the resources of the rich and then you redistribute. Right. But and, and some would perhaps say that foreign aid has been a sort of tool for a sort of global redistribution. Uh, <clears throat> but as we know, foreign aid is far from enough. <laughs> We're talking about huge challenges here. What will an adequate response to global inequality look like then uh, on a state to state level? Um, one thing is what we hope to achieve in, in poorer countries in terms of poverty reduction. That's one thing, uh, where foreign aid clearly is one of the tools. Um, but what are the implications for the rich countries? What are the specific consequences for rich countries as well? This, this seems to go beyond the existing tools that we have. I'd like to hear you comment on this. Um, but Vega, you can start this one. Well, well that's a good question. Um, um, and, and, and just drawing a bridge from the last one, because I'm a great fan of goals, really, <laughs> to be honest. Not, not because they're realistic, but because they, I mean, maybe it's not my background in politics, or but they draw resources, right? And they draw focus and attention, and, and they kind of they set a bar uh, uh, for us. Um, and I think we've seen this, I mean, in many national contexts, but also globally, look at the the, the Paris uh, Agreement, their goals, the MDGs, the SDGs, or or, or the NATO two percent goal to to think something uh, very differently, and, and that's also I think what we what we need to do now. Where we're we're in a situation now where you know the goals and the reality is diverging, it's becoming tougher to to reach the SDGs and so on. What we should do. Uh, is to challenge ourselves, the private sector, the public sector, everyone. What do we actually need to do, uh, to do to reach these goals if we are serious about the problems they will create? Mm -hmm. uh, and and my take on that would also be uh, on inequality. Well, we're spending most of our resources, whether it be public or private, in our own country, in our own context. While the major problems now, the pandemic, the climate crisis, inequality, are global issues, may we, we simply see, uh, have to do spend more there, uh, use the evidence better, like we've heard, and 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 uh, 
and challenge ourselves to do more and do it better. Before, before we let the others comment, uh, as we're approaching the end of this panel as well, but I would like specifically um, to hear as well uh, if you could say something about how, how should we tackle this increase of inequality that stems from, for example, within the pandemic response, that, that stems from the fact that health ministers and, and state leaders uh, just like to priorities, prioritize their own populations first, right? Uh, if we look at the last couple of years, um, has this period been a major blow to global solidarity and to, to multilateralism? Or has it been an eye-opener uh, in terms of the interdependence between countries? I would like to hear you comment on that, uh, that as well. So, so you, can, you can comment on that, Mr. Steiner. Well, let me first of all agree with Mark completely. I think goals help us to focus. And I would make a very strong plea that um, the world has one set of goals right now, which is uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. It is actually our agenda for, first of all, recognizing the key challenges, the key risks to our common future that we agreed in 2015. There are targets, there are indicators, but I think most importantly, we have a shared understanding of what will define what happens next um, in our world, on our planet. So in the midst of this crisis, there are some who are essentially getting entangled in the indicators and targets. I would appeal to all of us, don't get lost in the detail. The fact that we actually have the SDGs is also the very foundation for dealing with what ultimately will become the long tail of this pandemic. It is not the health crisis in itself, the virus as such. It is the social, the economic, the political fallout that will be a long tail. And our ability to act on that has to begin by also putting in place an equivalent stimulus that allows the wealthier countries of this world, and here I specifically also look to the G20, to put in place an SDG stimulus or something along those lines. I think the numbers are, as always, going to be something that you know one has to debate and agree on. But you know, just for argument's sake, 10% of all the stimulus packages in the G20 country put together as an SDG stimulus short term for the next few years to help countries recover, to avoid the kind of debt risk scenario that we already see. This is the most immediate just in the financial system to address the extreme poverty that has grown by over 100 million people, to facilitate and accelerate the kind of investments that then allow us to you know, give access to energy. One reason why UNDP in the next few years has committed itself to something it has never done in its history, namely trying to assist 500 million people, a half a billion people, to gain access to affordable clean energy is not because we think this is easily doable, but because we think there is just no other way in which we can put forward a commensurate response and work with others to achieve this. And that is in part premised also on an understanding that the SDGs carry. You can deal with um, something like uh, climate change, SDG 13, energy, SDG 7, poverty, SDG 1, with the very same project, enabling rural communities across Africa through mini off-grids to have access to electricity is about uh, poverty reduction, it's access to energy. It is about dealing with a low carbon energy future. It addresses gender issues and gender inequality that Ariana also referred to. That is the way we need to approach development and we need to go to scale. If we continue to try to respond to this mega crisis with mini projects and initiatives, we are doomed to fail. And just the last word, do we know what the outcome will be in terms of solidarity, multilateralism falling apart as a world community? No, I don't think we do. But to those who say, oh, it's all too late and we have fallen apart, no, we have not. We have gone through these crises in history, usually common sense and um, also a fundamental sense of solidarity do eventually prevail. The question is, can we make this happen faster and more effectively? Because we live in a world of 8 billion people now in the midst of an extraordinary crisis, almost without precedent in terms of synchronicity. All right, Dr. Alakija, just... 30 seconds, final comment. What are your thoughts on, the, on what the pandemic is showing us about ourselves and the international uh, collaboration and global collective action? Um, well, a global, a, a global crisis requires a global um, response. And at the moment, we're acting 
um, in 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 silos. We're not acting as a as a world. I've said repeatedly, and I think it's been repeated before in in, in Norway, um, that a once in a hundred year crisis demands a once in a hundred year level of response and global solidarity. Uh, we need to reimagine the systems that we have and the institutions that we currently have. That is my my short answer to it. That many of our institutions and our systems are going to are proving themselves to not be fit for purpose within this pandemic and will not be fit for purpose in a post-pandemic world. So if we're going to survive as a global society, it was good to hear Akeem refer to the G20. I also talk about the G7. You know, we need to begin to relook at these structures and what exactly, you know, as well as multilateralism as, as it exists and how do we improve that? It is absolutely the way to go, multilateralism. But, you know, just like the Second World War reshaped the world in many ways, I believe COVID and this current crisis leading us into climate, which we hope doesn't become a crisis, will also help us to reshape the world and to have a more um, equal um, balance of representation and voices going forward so that we can leave a better world for our generations to come. Thank you. And finally, I'll, I'll, I'll let my boss also have 30 seconds for a final comment. What do I got? Well, you and your 30 seconds, uh, uh, I, I, I totally echo Akim and, and Yodi. So just let me add, I mean, we're seeing two competing trends, really. Uh, one of, of, we have to take more care of ourselves now in the dangerous times. Uh, it started before COVID. But also one of, I mean, look how interconnected we are. That, that all the solutions, whether it be uh, uh, climate or COVID, are global. We, we're not safe uh, uh, until the rest of the world is safe. And, and it's for real. And uh, just me, uh, and uh, also by saying that I, I'm really energized by this day uh, from this the discussion this morning with the Norwegian Minister of Development uh, on the Beata Tvinraim and, and 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 the rest of the day and, and and maybe also taking picking up the challenge from Ola Rosling because I like goals and he he was giving us the challenge and I wrote it down Norway should be the first fact based country in the world. <laughs> And and uh, uh, I thought that was interesting. Uh, it's it's a long stretch, but but maybe both Norad and, and others and, and Norway could do even more to base our decisions on a better understanding on yeah. and on the facts. Mm -hmm. I think that would lead us to to prioritizing global issues and and uh, global solutions more, and maybe also to to working in better ways and 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 doing better decisions on all these issues for instance inequality unfortunately it's my job to to end now this <clears throat> has been highly interesting and i just need to thank you all for sharing your thoughts and insights um and also showing just a little bit of what lies ahead of us thank you so much on behalf of norad for your participation Ladies and gentlemen, this conference has three take-home messages. Zero poverty, zero emissions, and facts inform policy. And how do we get there? By game-changing solutions. Now, before we round off, we'd like to invite you to another global event coming up. On the 16th and 17th of February, Norway will be hosting the Global Disability Summit, and you're all welcome. Please check the program and sign up at globaldisabilitysummit.org. All right, the 2022 NORAD conference is now over, and we'd like to thank you so much, everybody. All the great panelists, the organizers, the technical team, uh, speakers and moderators, and all of you who have been watching from far and near. Thank you very much and welcome back next year. <laughs>